Hi, welcome to Maverick Mindcast. My guest today is, I guess I'd call you a conspiracy researcher, esoteric author, Wayne McCroy. Welcome, Wayne. Thanks for joining Hi, thanks us. for having me on the show. Oh, <laughs> yeah. it's such a great, it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, I like to tell people I accidentally became an expert in occult philosophy. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's one of the, my uh, fortes that I, I study. Uh, and I, I didn't get down that rabbit hole on purpose either. So that's why I tell people it was, was kind of an accidental thing. But uh, when you explore any of these conspiracy type topics down to uh, their roots, you always run into one of two things. Okay, you either run into the occult, right? And uh, this traces back to uh, what's called the ancient mystery schools back in antiquity, uh, which are kind of brought forward today through the different various secret society groups. Uh, um, so that's not the, to interrupt you, but that you hit exactly on my first question okay. <laughs> was how, how can you define how the mystery schools later morphed into the secret society? So if you, you're, you know, I want to let you continue, but that was a question I had. <laughs> Okay, yeah, we'll get to the questions, and they're all good questions, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, essentially, the, the two places you wind up when you uh, invariably study any of these quote-unquote conspiracy theory type topics is you'll end up either back with occultism uh, and tied back to the ancient mystery schools when you explore it all the way to its roots in the past, or the other end you'll end up on will be uh, when you look forward into the future, you find the end game of all of this is the transhumanist philosophy. Uh, and that's where you will find all these dots connect and everything leads to these same two places. So you have your beginnings in the ancient mystery schools and uh, the, your future or the, the end game here, so to say, of all of this with the transhumanist philosophy and uh, the transhumanist singularity. So that's kind of how I got to where I was. I started out actually uh, first studying the, the UFO topic uh, mm -hmm. and it, it's just astounding where all of those different uh, research bits take you like it takes you down these different trails you wouldn't expect and uh, then I later through uh, you know personal things that have happened through the years to myself and others around me I started exploring more of the biomedical field and uh, a lot of these different uh, paths as far as that goes and looking more into the secret society groups and things like that so uh, I wound up with a, a pretty diverse knowledge of uh, a lot of these different concepts and uh, was able to uh, put them together in different ways in book form. And also I uh, do podcasting as well. I'm, I've, uh, I have my own podcast. It's out there on Apple Podcasts and Spotify for people if they're interested. It's called Alchemical Tech Revolution. And that's also the name of my first book I wrote too. Uh, so people could check that out. And I'm also uh, there it is. Uh, yeah, you have it. There you go. Uh, so that, that one's kind of a primer of all these different awesome. topics and how they interrelate. Yeah, so I uh, did enough. Oh, just one other funny thing. I ordered this off Amazon and it mysteriously got lost the first time. I was amazing. Like, Why isn't it coming? Why isn't it coming? And it even said, I'm in Florida. It said it was in Orlando, which I'm not in Orlando, but it's not that far. Never came. I actually had to reorder it. Wow. Sorry to hear that. I hope they refunded you for it. They should have. Oh, yeah, they did, okay. but it was just kind of weird. I was like, of all the books, I've never had that happen before. Maybe somebody stole it. <laughs> I mean, that, I that used so, to happen to I Bill Cooper. Read it. <laughs> that used to happen to Bill Cooper back in the day when he wrote uh, Behold a Pale Horse. That book really? got stolen off of the store shelves all the time and uh, you know, out of the mail and everything. So, uh, yeah. So I don't know, maybe, um, maybe that's what happened. Maybe not. Maybe it just got lost. I mean, things do get lost, unfortunately, could be a coincidence, but we know how they are with the, the whole coincidence idea. With yeah. everything. But uh, was, was there anywhere in particular you wanted to begin here uh, as far as looking at uh, uh, different aspects of this whole thing? Sure. Well, I just wanted to let the audience know that your new book, The Demic of Pan, breaking the natural order is kind of what I want to talk about since it's your newest book and there's just chock full of information. Um, I do feel like the, the foundational aspect of it is the archetypes, um, right. how they're being used to craft a new mythology. So if you can just share a little bit about what archetypes are, a lot of people don't know what that means and then kind of how they influence us subconsciously. 
Okay, the idea of the archetype. Now, this goes back a lot further than people think. The one that really popularized this idea in the uh, early 20th century was Carl Jung, right? Uh, people may have heard of him, uh, the psychologist guy. He popularized the idea of the archetype and what he calls the collective unconscious. Uh, and But these ideas are far older than Carl Jung. See, most people don't know this, but Carl Jung was an alchemist. And uh, he practiced a lot of these different esoteric type sciences. So he understood some of these foundational principles and tried to put them into more modern terms, more modern parlance. And thus he used the term archetype to describe some of these things. Uh, and what exactly this is, is this relates back to, uh, it's kind of an inherent genetic memory that we all have. Uh, it's something that hits up on the unconscious mind that registers in the unconscious mind and affects you on a subconscious level although you're not consciously aware of it. Uh, so these, these different types of archetypes can affect you. They can affect your psyche in different ways without you even realizing on a conscious level that they're doing so. Uh, and a lot of this relates back to symbolism, symbology, uh, things like this, uh, some of these different archetypal concepts. Uh, these are largely what uh, many of the stories of mythology are based upon, are these archetypal ideas. These are inherent natural energies uh, out there in the natural realm that we inherently understand through uh, what they term, uh, there's, there's various different terms for this, okay? Uh, in the occult circles, they call some of this the Akashic record, uh, that kind of a concept. Uh, when you look at it from the more modern day scientific viewpoint, they call it genetic memory or epigenetic memory. Uh, there's there's various other things that, that go along with it. There's various other descriptions of it. Uh, some of the, like the the shamanic type uh, traditions would call it like uh, ancestral memories, ancestral spirits, this kind of stuff. But there's certain ideas that we recognize, right? It, it's inherent in our human nature. When we see something, we have this guttural type primal reaction to it that doesn't always affect us on a conscious level, but we recognize it. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of different symbols that are used in this way to invoke different feelings, right? Emotions, uh, stir up certain emotions and different types of energies like this within the person. And this is primarily what an archetype is. I, I don't really have a much better description of that, but it's, it's an idea, it's a concept uh, that uh, you will recognize. It's a pattern, you see, that you recognize in some type of a symbol, but you don't recognize it on the conscious waking level but your unconscious mind recognizes it and it does affect you in a subconscious way. Uh, so that will eventually alter your behavior in some way, shape or form. And there are people in positions of power in this world that understand this because uh, make no mistake about it, people in the higher echelons of the control structure in this world are very much involved in the occult. They understand a lot of these occult concepts and they leverage them against the masses. Uh, so that's that's kind of uh, the the vantage point I come from with the archetype because they've learned how to use these subjective ideas to influence people's behaviors, and this has to do a lot with uh, what you would call mass psychology as well. Uh, so you know they could steer whole people groups with different ideas by invoking these different archetypes, and uh, I could go ahead and cite this type of archetype with the whole. Uh, thing that happened on 9-11, right? You have your twin towers. Uh, that's, that's an archetype. I mean, all you have to do is look at the, the tarot card, the, the tower card, uh, and uh, you could kind of understand this concept. So you have these towers falling. It's invoking fear. It invokes this primal fear uh, by using this type of an archetype, uh, the twin pillars, twin towers, this goes back into Masonic symbolism and stuff as well. This represents uh, what the Freemasons call Joaquin and Boaz, okay, the, the two pillars of foundation. Uh, so this is something that uh, your unconscious mind will recognize as a, uh, an archetypal symbol, right? You may not be consciously aware of it, and you may not have ever learned anything about any of this stuff, but it'll still affect you on an emotional level, on a subconscious level. Uh, and that's why they use a lot of these things to amplify uh, the emotional state of people in many ways. And this would be hitting on the primary emotion of fear. And that's one of the primary ones that they use for control. Uh, so it, it, it kind of incorporates a, a control mechanism into your, into your mind, okay? And a lot of this 
really ties back to uh, the question of what exactly is consciousness. So uh, many of these people in these occult orders, these secret society groups in the highest, most uh, echelons of them, understand a little bit more about this stuff than your average person and are able to leverage these different types of archetypes against people in different ways to invoke a certain reaction. And this is, uh, this could be kind of uh, equated to a control mechanism that's called Hegelian dialectic. I don't know if anybody out there is familiar with that term. Uh, essentially, uh, uh, you know, there's people that describe it very simply as it's called problem, reaction, solution. So they create a problem. They put that out there uh, for the masses to affect the mass psychology. There's this problem to invoke a specific reaction from the public. And they 99.9% .9 of the time they get the reaction they want from them. And then they introduce the solution to the problem, which invariably takes away more and more of your rights and um, more and more of your freedoms. Uh, so that's, that's one of the ploys that they use uh, effectuating these different types of archetypes in that way for social control. Uh, and this is a science called social engineering. Uh, and it's going on all throughout our society today. And it, it's, it's been heavily done. And we've seen the echoes of this the past two years in a very real way. Uh, so if anybody doubts what I'm saying here about that, I mean, uh, all you got to do is open your eyes and look around and see what's been done to the people in the name of fear, fearing this invisible thing that you, <laughs> you have no way to know whether it's really there or not. Uh, even to the, the, the point where they, they've convinced people they could be sick without really being sick. So <laughs> that should tell you something right there. They're invoking a, a different type of a, an archetypal thing to uh, create this behavior in people. Uh, but I guess that's, you know, I've kind of rambled on a long time there uh, with the description of what the archetype is. But uh, for people who are unaware, the archetype is something that could be uh, that your mind will unconsciously recognize, subconsciously react to, that you won't be in your field of conscious awareness. Uh, so it, it will affect your behavior in some way, shape or form. And there are people that's, that use this method for control. And that's, that's the bottom line here. Okay, and what about the, oh, I guess, etymological <laughs> tactics, like word origins, things like that? Do you have any examples of that? Or can you talk a little bit about that where it's not just imagery, it's also kind of words that they use? And... Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I could definitely talk on that. Uh, when you look at the roots of where words come from, this is a very important concept as well. The etymology of words, because words have meaning and sometimes they have hidden nuance that uh, our modern language is unaware of. Uh, we use them differently than we once did in many uh, respects. So uh, when you see some of these type words, uh, oftentimes they will be invoking an archetype within the word that you're unaware of. Like if you look back at uh, what does Corona mean? Well, Corona back in the original parlance and language that it was used in, uh, the original word origin means crown or a ray of the sun. And it always equates to royalty and the sun. Uh, so this is a, a, an archetype of authority, right? So uh, this is one way where they've leveraged an archetype uh, based upon words and symbols. And, and this is both uh, in the word, the spoken word and the symbol here, because words actually are symbols. But you see how this one word or this one concept or image has been leveraged in a way to inspire fear in people and to uh, kind of give them this air of authority with this. So that's, that's why they invoked Corona uh, with the coronavirus at the crown. So, you know, thus applying the idea and it, it's a concept and, and it might be hard for some people to, to bridge the gap here to understand, but it's a concept that, like I said, your unconscious mind will recognize, okay, Corona, that, that's relating to the crown, that's relating to the rays of the sun, which all this has uh, esoteric ties uh, back to the ancient mystery school and all that, those different teachings there as well. But uh, it invokes this aura of authority. So when they're talking to you about coronavirus, right? And they're using this, it invokes a type of authority. So it will uh, inspire your un unconscious mind uh, to create this subconscious type of a, um, how should I say, unction to follow 
whatever directions that they give to you uh, in regards to this thing, because that's the archetype they're invoking there. And it's a very subjective thing, right? And like I said, if you look at it uh, from a strictly conscious viewpoint, you, you might be thinking, okay, well, that, that's nonsense, right? I, I wouldn't even know what, you know, I think of Corona, it's, it's beer, right? <laughs> the Corona is beer. Uh, so I, most people wouldn't bridge that gap or think in that way. Uh, it's a, a different way of thinking, but this is the way that these dark occultists that run this place think, right? And that's the important concept. So whether you believe any of this stuff or not is immaterial. There are people in positions of power in this world that very much believe in these concepts and use them. And the things they do to use them will affect all of us. So it's important that you understand where it is they're coming from, what they believe with this and how they utilize it in different ways against you. And this is just one example of uh, how they've done this. Uh, so uh, they've taken the word Corona, you know, issued it into coronavirus, which coronaviruses have existed for a long time and shouldn't really be that fear inspiring, right? Because generally they're equated to the common cold. Well, they, they upped their game a little with it, didn't they? They, they really invoked this archetype and they, they played it hard with the people and they, they pushed uh, this different uh, type of fear uh, along with this whole thing and created a new narrative. And that's essentially what they do by leveraging these archetypes. They're attempting to craft a new narrative. And uh, narrative is a very important term. And it's one that they actually have been using as of late. Uh, if you go to the World Economic Forum and look at some of their activity as of late, most people are familiar with the idea of what they call the Great Reset, right? Well, now they've kind of shifted their focus and they call it the Great Narrative. Mm -hmm. well, so it's very uh, important to listen to the nuance of the words that they use. There's a kind of uh, inference in the word narrative, okay? And, and usually narrative will imply some type of a fictitious type of a, a nuance to it or a fictitious type of a, uh, an inference, right? So that's why when they use narrative, well, it makes your mind say, hold on a second, time out. Narrative, hmm, what do they mean by that? Are they talking about just a description of something or are they crafting a story? And this is their way of showing their hand in a sense. They're crafting a story for you to follow. They're, they're letting you know in no uncertain terms, hey, we're making up this new fiction for you to follow. Uh, it would be, be in your best interest to follow along and it would be in our best interest for you to follow along. So that's kind of how they do things. And, uh, you know, I know it sounds like kind of, uh, kind of strange to some people to, to say that, but uh, they, they choose the wording of the things they say and these different concepts they use very carefully. And there's a reason for that because there's also a karmic principle that comes into play with a lot of it too. So uh, that's the thing. I mean, it, it's a lot to unpack and there's a lot of different occultic type ideas that underlie all of this stuff. And it's a different way of thinking for most people. Uh, so that's why sometimes it may sound a little convoluted or hard to describe here. Uh, but uh, when you get to the core of what goes on, how these people who run things in this world operate, they use different karmic energies, okay? And people are familiar with the term karma. Uh, and one of the things that they have to do, which is an absolute natural law principle, is they have to tell you what they're doing. Uh, because they need your consent. They need your tacit consent to do anything to you in the, this place. And this is a, a very important occult principle that uh, most people don't understand or has escaped most people. So in order to do something to you or, you know, put a situation in place that affects you, they have to tell you up front what it is they're doing. And they do this through a means called predictive programming, right? Uh, we see this out in the entertainment field all the time. They'll show you in movies and stuff, things that they have planned for the future. And then when you actually see it in real life and recognize it, well, then it's already been, the idea has been uh, kind of engrafted into your mind uh, from the beginning. And uh, your, your uh, re, you know, disregard for it or your, your complacency to it, they take that as your tacit consent for uh, the approval of that. So if you don't object to something that they show you, in entertainment form, they take that as your tacit consent uh, to have that done or have that become a reality. Uh, and in so doing, they kind of skirt around this karmic principle uh, that guides them so much. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a convoluted way to think, but I assure you that's how they do things. Uh, they'll show you it in entertainment form first, 
or in some strange ways like that. And then, uh, you know, they, they could just come out and claim, well, we've, we've showed you that this is a possibility and you didn't object to that possibility. So that's your consent and that's how they view your consent. It's a principle I call metaphysical consent because I, I don't really know a better term for it, uh, but uh, that, that's kind of how they do things. Uh, and that's why they, they leverage a lot of these uh, different archetypal type principles and stuff like that against us as well. They show us in no uncertain terms, something that you'll recognize on an unconscious level or even on a conscious level in many regards now, when you're talking about the, the entertainment form of it. Uh, this among different initiates of these secret orders is called revelation of the method. Uh, so they, they re reveal to you what they're planning, what they're doing, and uh, they do this for the different karmic reasons that uh, we discussed here. So uh, there's there's a lot to unpack here, like I said, and I, I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm rambling and going on side no, trails. No, but, no. Uh, um, but, no, yeah. like for instance, you have <laughs> Event 201, you have movies like uh, V for Vendetta. <laughs> if you just yeah. watch that movie, it's like, people, come on. You know, you can't say, oh, well, that's just the, you know, it's it's so revealing but at the same time, I do think, I think you had said indifference equals right. indifference consent. And that's what I'm seeing happening en masse, you know, right now, mm -hmm. when I feel like the culprits that are allowing this have been all the technology they're introducing, which is just literally just hijacking the minds of people. You know, I see people out in the wild in reality and it's just, they'll do anything to keep their eyes on their phone, even with their children, you know, here, candy, toy, go just here, you take a device, you know, so I can look yep. at my device. And I just feel like that's the big difference between, you know, talking about it, showing your hand and doing it and getting away with it. It's previously, we didn't have all these distractions. Now you have, oh, Elon Musk buys Twitter and you know, it's just like one thing after the other, after the other. And people focus on, say, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard <laughs> over Ghislaine Max. It's like, you really? Like, you know, it's just amazing to me what people focus on these days and what they want to, they want access to. It's not about anything that will affect their own lives. It's about these ridiculously trivial things, you know, and I think one of the big things they push is this hero complex, which is really dangerous, right? I'm just noticing that everywhere, left, right, center, everyone has this like hero complex of, um, you know, somebody's going to swoop in and like a lawn now, Musk is going to save us. Or, you know, my other question to you is, I just think it's so interesting because when I look back now on like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, like all these movies, and the David and Goliath, which you mentioned in your book. The little guy always wins though. So is that just a way of pacifying people into not, oh, we don't have to worry because you know, the good always conquers evil. Like, you know, because if they're showing their hand, it's very rare you'll see a Marvel movie or you'll see any of these big movies that if you really look at them, they push so much of what's going on right now. It's actually ridiculous. Um, of what, you know, the tyranny and the control and, you know, the reason behind it, uh, the occult type um, details, but, but they never win in the end. So is that like, what's your take on that? <laughs> well, there's, there's several different layers to that to unpack. Uh, the first one is this. Okay. If you're convinced, okay, that uh, the little guy is going to win in the end, right. Or uh, somebody's going to re to step up and save you from this, what does that create? That creates complacency, yeah. indifference, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's that's part of the social engineering trope that goes on with this whole thing. Uh, the, the other concept here is, and this is an important one. This was uh, pointed out by Joseph Campbell in uh, uh, you know some of right. his writings and stuff like that. It's the hero's journey concept, okay? And a lot of this is uh, influential in the entertainment, right? Uh, because in order to create an effective story that people will want to watch and, and you know, follow along with and, and really be vested in, uh, it has to have some very critical factors within the story. And uh, Joseph Campbell laid out 12 different steps in the hero's journey. And it doesn't necessarily have to have all of those steps. But uh, for these stories to uh, 
effectively keep people's attention and uh, capture their minds, uh, it has to have some of these different concepts in there. Uh, so that's that's one of the reasons as well, because you you have you want to have this hero, right? You want to have this model to follow, this this uh, this archetype, so to say. It's a hero archetype, and that's one of the archetypes here. Uh, so when you have this hero going on this journey, it kind of uh, we could all relate to it in a certain way on an inner level, uh, because it, it's it's something that's uh, shared by all human beings, right? We all have these common experiences and we all have uh, some of these common themes that, uh, that link us all together. So these are things that you could recognize in a person. So uh, this makes it uh, a type of archetype. And this is one of the other ways where they leverage things as well with a lot of these stories. And a perfect example of uh, you know the hero's journey, if people are interested in looking at that, would be the original Star Wars film that came out in 1977. It lays out every single step in, of the 12 in the hero's journey. And uh, when Lucas put it out, he made sure that he hit upon all these concepts from Joseph Campbell with the hero's journey because it makes a compelling story and it makes it something that people want to see and follow along with, something they could relate to. And that's kind of what we need. People need something that they could relate to and you know that kind of a thing along with this. Uh, and I don't think like all the storytelling motifs that go on are necessarily geared for controlling people, so to say, or steering them in a certain direction, but they do get leveraged by these people in positions of power in that way. So it's not to say every single production or something that comes out is a uh, social programming event, uh, but they do get leveraged in that way with some of the concepts. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what happens uh, with many of these different stories, even though they do portray uh, some good aspects and stuff to them. Uh, much of what we see coming out of Hollywood in recent years, though, it, it kind of uh, throws aside that whole hero conception, doesn't it? It's all about the anti-hero now or the villain. You see how the villains a lot of times get glorified these days. It's a, it's a shift in the thinking, and that's what's been going on the past couple decades here now. It's a shift in the way that we think. So we're not necessarily seeking to identify with this hero figure. Instead, they're giving us this other figure to identify with, the anti-hero, so to say. Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, there's, there's very many different tropes that they use for this idea, but they're all designed to create indifference, right? Indifference or complacency on our part, uh, because they, they want to keep you confused. Okay, because there's there's a lot of profit in confusion. Uh, this they know and this they, they work with. Uh, so if they keep you confused, you're easier to control. And uh, don't don't we see that being the case of things that have happened uh, in our reality here the past couple of years? They keep everybody purposely confused about things. They, one day they'll tell them one thing and then the next day they'll tell them the complete opposite is true. Uh, so what do you do? You don't know, right? So your average person would not be able to... Uh, take in this kind of information, this contradictory information and utilize it in a proper way. So what happens is the mind shuts down and then you just listen to what you're told, right? You listen to the authority figure. That's what it's about here. So they, they, they try to convince people to listen to an authority figure, which may or may not be an actual authority on a subject. Uh, that's another topic altogether. Like they'll, they'll put a front man out there and say, this is the expert, listen to the expert. Do you see his nice white lab coat? He knows what he's talking about. He's, he's got a degree, look at that paper on the wall back there he has. You don't have that, you should listen to him rather than do your own research. You, you can't trust anything that you find on the internet. And haven't we seen that going on? The past two or years, he has a pink sweater. He doesn't have a degree in anything, but he has a pink sweater. I mean, he's but he's rich. Money, he's rich. Right? Listen to the rich guy, right? You know, the rich guy whose father was head of Planned Parenthood, uh, the, the proven and known eugenicist who actually said in a public speech that if we do a really great job with vaccines, we could reduce the population uh, by about 30 percent. So <laughs> like uh, but he wants to save your life, Wayne. He I know. Cares. I know. Right. He's he, these guys are our best buds. Right. Like Elon Musk. He really cares about free speech. Right. The same guy that oh, wants to put right. a brain implant in your head and, uh, you know, hook it up to the, his Starlink satellites. He, he really cares about you being able to speak your mind. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> I, 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 I don't I'm know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't know why people can't 
see through that cult of personality with a lot of that. Hey, the important but, uh, thing is Alex Jones got his Twitter account back. Okay. <laughs> Clearly it's all upward from there. You know, Yeah, it's so funny because yeah, there's you. so much of the alternative media is just like a life preserver clinging to that. And I yeah. say, well, I don't have a Twitter account. Am I, does that mean I'm doomed to like eternal hell or something? Like, because this apparently was the either. salvation for everyone. That's, you know, even in the, the alternative media, it's being, you know, just pushed out as everything's going to be okay now because, you know, Twitter's owned by somebody else who's, who's going to restore certain accounts. And it's like, well, I don't have a Twitter account. So does that mean I'm, I'm going to be left out of this uh, new utopia that we're being ushered into? <laughs> it's... Oh. That, that's the other thing. I mean, they, they play all sides of the field. That, that's the point here. Uh, the people in control, they're very clever about how they do things. And they control the narrative across all different angles. So even those people you see in the alternative media, like especially the bigger name ones, well, of course, they're going to jump on this and say, oh, this is great and this and that, uh, when it's all contrived from the get-go. I mean, it, it's all about the same thing. It's all about... Uh, uh, bringing together and consolidating these different platforms all under one umbrella, right? Uh, so that that's what's been going on, and we've seen this happening through the you know the past several decades, where all the media, about ninety five percent of all media, is owned by no more than six companies. Six that's probably companies. Too generous. To say. And yeah, that's probably too generous uh, because they've done so many mergers and stuff like that. It may actually be one or two at this point. And, and here's the thing, all the steering committees and stuff of these companies that own all the media, uh, they're all interlocked in the, you know, the, the uh, inner circles of some of these various secret society groups. So uh, that being the case, uh, they have controlling shares going across the board in, in all of this stuff. Uh, and when you actually look at news media in particular, uh, you have to realize where the news media comes from. And a lot of people aren't very savvy as to how this actually happens, right? Uh, if you look at your local newscast, right, just turn on your local ABC station or whatever, they'll come out, they have a certain format they follow. Here's your top stories. Well, do you know where they get all those top stories from? Uh, usually it's what's called a news wire service, right, uh, that puts out these stories. So they give them this already pre-written, pre-canned story from one of these newswire services. Here you go. This is the top news today. Read from the script. And uh, you could actually see examples of this. Go on YouTube and look at all the examples of all these local newscasts uh, that are repeating verbatim, yes. word for word, the same they stories. They all at the same time, and they're all yep. saying the same thing. They're all saying the same thing. Like This is, is proof positive of the concept there. Uh, this is a known commodity. It's called a newswire service. There's very few of them. And they're the ones that put out the news and control the narrative that goes out. So that puts a whole lot of power in the hands of a very few people, doesn't it? Uh, when you work for AP Newswire or, or some such place like that, or, you know, CNN Newswire, CNN has their own newswire service that they use too. Uh, so they have this person or, or people in an office somewhere, however many few, however few there are, or how many there are, well, they they come up and analyze all the news stories of the day and decide what they're going to put out there for the public to consume, because that's what it's about, consumerism, right? That's that's the primary motivator in this world we live in. Material bread and circuses, as you said. <laughs> yeah, it's it's all bread and circuses. It's all about keeping the people's minds engaged in something that doesn't really matter. First of all. Uh, and, you know, so that you could kind of vampirize their energy. And that's what they do with us. They vampirize our human energy in different ways. And, uh, you know, they keep us entertained, don't they? And that, that's, that's the whole concept. Yeah, you could go back to Rome and all roads always lead to Rome. Uh, you could see the bread and circuses model. If you give people enough to eat, give them enough food options and give them enough entertainment, they won't revolt, right? <laughs> if, they, if they don't want for food... And they don't want, uh, you know, for entertainment choices, then there'll always be something engaging their minds other than things that matter, what the policy uh, uh, think tank groups and stuff are doing. They won't think about that or care about that or even know about that. Most people don't. So that, that's the thing. These, these government officials and stuff that we elect into positions of power, it's an illusion. 
they don't really run anything. That's the problem here. They they just uh, are the face out there, the public persona that they push out there uh, for a lot of these different ideas. But there's there's different uh, what you would call uh, what do people call the deep state or the shadow government, that kind of thing. These people, these unelected officials who actually make policy and push forward policy. And many of them don't actually work in governments either. They work in uh, these philanthropic organizations and uh, you know these different international organizations like the World Economic Forum. That's one of the major ones right now that's got, got an awful lot of influence. So they go out there, they put forward these ideas and policies and they get their people in key places within political cabinets and stuff like that. And then they're able to implement these different ideas across the platform in many different governments around the world. So that's one of the ways that uh, they, they operate and they do things in a subtle way, and maintain control with this whole uh, air of, uh, you know, um, staying behind what they call the veil, right? They, they keep themselves hidden, the real controllers of this place, the ones that make actual policy and come up with these agendas, they stay hidden. They, they use their own puppets, so to say. They use these other people as puppets or, uh, you know, that kind of thing to put these ideas out there for people and they keep their identities hidden from the masses. So we, that, that's the thing. There's people that control this place that uh, people aren't looking at because they, they're just looking at the figurehead up there and they don't understand that behind the figurehead, there's other people making decisions and pushing forward these ideas. And this guy is just their mouthpiece. Uh, and, and that could be said across all of politics and everything else. So, you know, that being the case, you can see it all creates right. this, right, it creates this air of plausible deniability, too, when something does come to fruition that's been, you know, put out there in the Hollywood production for years and years and, and things like that. It creates this, uh, this plausible deniability type of a, a situation for leaders in this world. Well, that's just ridiculous to think we would plan something like that, right? Uh, like, you know. Come on, though, like a Ventura one. Yeah, it's just. It's insane. I, I I always liken it to when I watch that movie, um, The Usual Suspects. You know, you just, or even the, what was the? Uh oh, I think I lost my connection. Hello? You know, <laughs> and was it a kingpin? Uh, and then you have like the Kaiser Soze who, you know, seemingly is this dumb, unassuming guy and limps and then starts walking away. And you're like, oh, okay. You know, it's like preying on the narcissists who want to be in the spotlight, compromising them, getting them to do what you want when you don't need them anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Chew them up and spit them out. But you're always there. You're always in right. that central position of power, calling all the shots. And most of the time I feel like we don't even know who they are and you know it's been rumored like you know when the monarchs got people got sick of them they just went into the shadows became the bankers became politicians and a lot of them are actually related but they're not going to say that you know I don't know if that's true or not but I've just like heard so many things about they just took a different guys you know they, they assumed a different disguise of like oh we're just like you you know we're, we're people we just entrepreneurially made it big you know same thing with the technology oh you know this was discovered in a garage i mean that's always the story <laughs> is it not it's like yeah they were just toying around in their garage and yeah like mark zuckerberg just he would he single-handedly made you know facebook yep. and it, it's just it, it's funny but i think you know there's this awakening going on and i do want to talk about that a little and you know because you talk about you know pisces i'm a pisces but uh, you know, you're a Pisces and, you know, trying to skip over Aquarius. And I thought that was interesting too, because it seems like we're going backwards then. Like, so we were in Aries, then we're in Pisces, now we're entering an Aquarius and then we're trying to skip to Capricorn, but that's going backwards on the Zodiac. So I had a question for you about that. Um, and then just some of the things I noticed uh, once we unpack that is just, you know, obviously the next not logical evolution of, trying to prevent this awakening that I feel is starting to happen, not fast enough for me, but whatever, is to just hijack then the alternative, because that seems to be the, the strategy they've done. Okay, they've hijacked all the major mainstream 
corporatized areas of our existence. But now, like you see, and the alternative media is all going crazy about Elon Musk, ignoring real, true threats to us, like the World Health Organization becoming the be all end all of dictating, you know, pandemic protocol to the entire world. You know, we, you don't hear about that anymore. And you just hear about, you know, celebrities impregnating multiple women and Elon Musk buying Twitter. So it, it just seems like that's the next evolution of wh where they're going to start seeking to control that alternative media. If they're not censoring it, they're going to infiltrate it to be like, hey, oh, yeah. kitty kitty over here. You know? Yeah. And they, they've, I think they've, uh, the argument could be made. They've already done that. Uh, they've, uh, infiltrated the alternative media they've infiltrated all these different groups and uh exactly the same thing goes with all this occult stuff too what what do you think the new age movement is all about yeah. see that that was all infiltrated and socially engineered from the get-go too by these same people and they teach people false things okay even based upon their own occult knowledge and they they admit to lying to their own lower level members in these different secret society groups. That's a known commodity in Freemasonry. Uh, Albert Pike in his uh, uh, seminal volume, Morals and Dogma came out and pretty much said, uh, you, you know, members of the fraternity that are under the 30th degree can't know certain things. Uh, so we teach them different meanings and they think they're correct in this meaning but uh, they're being misled until they're actually led into the grander secrets, the greater mysteries later in their teaching. And this goes across all different secret society groups too, not just the Freemasons. They're the most commonly known one though. So they're the ones that we could point out and say, okay, well here, you know, if you're familiar with how this all works within these groups, the lower level members are, are pretty much kept in the dark about things until they hit a certain initiation level. And then they might be led in on some of the more, uh, you know, the deeper secrets or the, the more uh, uh, juicy secrets, so to say. So that's that's how a mechanism of control they have in place for their their lower level members too. Uh, it's it's about controlling people, see. Uh, so if you can control people in the lower tier and keep them uh, actually grasping at straws for something different, uh, it's it's kind of like a, the allegory of dangling a carrot in front of uh, the horse, right? To keep the horse moving forward in the direction you want. And he never actually gets the hold of the carrot. Well, it's the same thing with these secret society groups. The promise of these new secrets, of this, this new esoteric knowledge, this secret knowledge, and you'll be you know, so much wiser than the rest and you'll, you'll know all these secrets. They dangle that like a carrot in front of these lower level initiates and they keep them going down the path they want. Uh, in the direction they want. They use it as a method of control for their own members even. And they kind of do this with the public too, right? Uh, in, in many different ways. But that's, that's one of the oldest tricks in the book as far as that goes. And these are some of the real secrets behind the secret societies. How to control people. That's what it's about. That's the big secret at the top, how to control people. Uh, that's, that's what they've been doing since time immemorial. And they've gotten very good at it. Uh, and they, they know a lot of different... Uh, aspects of the natural world, how these things work on a different level than your average person. And I'm talking about the ones at the uppermost echelons of these secret society groups, uh, these occultists that uh, I, I like to call them the dark occultists that run this place, right? Uh, because they utilize these principles for their own greedy ends, right? They're, they're looking to um, push forward their own ideas and agendas and their own best interests at the expense of the masses because they don't believe that the masses deserve to uh, take part in their new age, right? Or in their new world order. They see us as the profane. That's what they call us, okay? If you're not an initiate or a member of their secret orders, if you don't have any of their, their training and you're not one of them, you are what they call the profane and you have no place in their new society. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one of the attitudes they have. They view you as being little more than an animal. You're a human resource. Yeah. And many of them in these esoteric orders, they don't even believe you have a soul unless you're initiated into one of their orders. Uh, and, you know, they, they dangle this carrot in front of people there once again and keep you yearning after these secrets of what they call, quote unquote, soul science. Uh, and they, they keep you going down that path, right? 
So that, that's one of the things that's been manipulated and used here. Uh, so they, they convince people in these secret society groups that are just going along with all of this, that uh, this is the direction they have to go in order to get to that next level secret, right? Or to, uh, you know, unlock this certain occult power, like the, you know, the ability to see in uh, these different, uh, diff different types of planes, th these different types of psychic sight and stuff like that, to have these different psychic powers and things like that. In order to progress through, uh, you know, a lot of these occult teachings, you have to do exactly what the master tells you, right? Uh, and that's how they, they egg people along through this. They always use this promise. If you're, if you're just good enough, if you follow the instructions and you really are, you know, you're wholeheartedly seeking this fervently, it'll come to you. But if it doesn't come to you, well, you just weren't, uh, you weren't pure enough of heart or that kind of thing. That's what they tell you. So it, it's all very manipulated uh, within this stuff and it all plays upon people's egos, right? So, uh, you know, they, they like to uh, mislead people in these different groups uh, in different ways because it's a system of control. Uh, and this is inherent in what they do. And a lot of this is what happens in high levels of power in this world. They like to mislead the public. If we're living in the age of deception. I mean, I don't think anybody could dispute that. It's all about deceit. Uh, this whole society that's been built in the world today is based upon deceit and death. It's a death cult at the center of all of it. Uh, it's uh, what Michael Hoffman calls the reign of dead matter. Okay, and that's, that's what the coming transhumanist idea is all about, the reign of dead matter, because uh, what they eventually want is for people to believe and accept that they could transfer their consciousness into a machine and live forever in the physical world by doing so. Uh, and so what is this? This is a dead entity. It's a dead thing. If you're living, uh, you know, if your consciousness is in a computer, is that really you? Is that your spirit? Is that your soul in there? Or is it just a clever replication of your thought processes? And, and that's the bottom line here. So they're, they're completely denying the whole spiritual aspect of this at one level. But there are people in the higher echelons of power that know a little something about the spiritual aspects of this. And that's exactly what they're trying to do is to trap people in this spiritual trap and get them to go along with this because then they have power over something, right? And well, there, there's, like there's the many reasons. the vampire thing you said, Wayne. I mean, I think it's perfect example. Um, I think they want to, because I, I think to myself, why do they want to kill so many people if they're using us to derive their energy and power? But then it's like, well, it's not that they necessarily want to off us all. They want to just kind of harvest us. So you don't even have to, function you know it's like the, the the promise they're giving to us is their promise i'm just speculating you know like like they're the ones who want to live forever and they think they can live forever by hooking us up and making us transhuman because then they don't have we don't have to worry about anything then we're not going to be owning anything we're not going to be functioning in reality we're not going to be reproducing we're just literally going to be like livestock existing right i mean and that that's the whole bottom line here uh, that's the thing. All these new technologies and stuff they put out and they, they make all these promises of, oh, this is going to change the medical field and stuff like this. You can live forever. Uh, all these different ideas. Why that's not intended anyway, though. <laughs> right. Well, that's not intended for you and me. That's not intended for the masses. That's only for the people yeah. in the high echelons of power. Uh, this small group uh, who see themselves as the elite, as the uh, rightful rulers of this place. And there's many reasons we could either get into or save for another discussion someday as to why they think they have the divine right to rule and uh, why they've situated themselves in these elevated positions in this world and why it is they do the things that they do. But uh, at the end of the day, that's the whole notion here. They intend for these transhumanist technologies and stuff for themselves, okay? It's not for you and me. It's not for the profane, right? They have no place for the profane in their new world. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, that's the key here. Uh, but they will harvest us and use us, like you said, yes. uh, as a resource. That's why they call us human resources, right? Uh, so, you know, look at the movie, The Matrix. It's a perfect allegory for what they have in mind. Uh, they, they just will utilize your energies or use you for whatever, you know, small petty job or whatever they have in mind for you and just try to keep you happy and compliant in doing 
the things they want you to do. And, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, when they're talking about this transhumanist push where you could transfer your consciousness into a machine. Well, like I said, there's a spiritual component here that is totally being disregarded. And there, there's a reason they're disregarding it because they don't want you uh, in the public, any of us in the public to really think of this in those terms, right? Because they want us to think in the materialist term. Uh, and that's what has largely been going on in society for the past several thousand years. They're steering us into this hyper-materialist viewpoint where it's all about consumerism. It's all about materialism. It's all about just the five senses, the things that we could sense with our five senses, the physical world we live in. They want to convince you there's nothing more than this. There's nothing beyond this. And that your consciousness is simply the byproduct of the chemical electro reactions of your brainstem. Uh, and if that's the case, then your consciousness could be equated down to nothing more than an algorithm and therefore could be duplicated in a machine. And that's what they're working on right now in these transhumanist circles, because many of them will staunchly believe that all of this is nothing more than the byproduct of some physical thing that happens here in our human body, in our brainstem, right? So if that's the case and they can duplicate that in a machine, then theoretically they could duplicate your consciousness in a machine. Uh, but uh, that completely disregards things that are known by those in the occult orders, first of all, and you know anybody that has any kind of a religious viewpoint, or anybody that considers the spiritual realm of things, or anybody that truly studies what consciousness is. Consciousness is a field. It doesn't exist within the human body, per se. It coincides with it, but it extends outside of that. And there have been scientific studies that have shown this, like uh, you know, in near-death experiences and things of that nature, uh, when, when you look at this kind of thing. Um, you know, it's, it's something that's well known by those in the occult circles too, uh, that there's many aspects to this reality that reach beyond this physical realm that we're in. But they would want you, the average person, to believe you're nothing more than a, an animal with a little bit more of a higher intelligence, right? So you're an intelligent animal. You're, you don't have a soul per se. Uh, you exist strictly here in the physical. And therefore it's in your best interest to maybe consider uploading your consciousness into a machine so you could live forever because otherwise once you're gone you're gone and that's what they try to convince people of and that's why they push things like atheism so hard they would they want people to to really think in these terms of this hyper materialist viewpoint uh whereas you know we're bound in this physical world and there's nothing more beyond here uh so if that's what uh, a lot of these scientists and stuff that are pursuing these technologies believe then that's what they're working for and then uh they have every reason to pursue it, right? And that's that's by and large one of the control mechanisms they have in place because there's there's people above that level that understand uh, more occultic type principles here, and uh, you know are are looking to use that transhumanist singularity for something beyond just what the stated purpose would be here in the the material world or the the physical plane, so to say. Uh, so uh, what they're trying to do is manifest something here in this place that doesn't truly belong, right? And that's, that's at the, the bottom line of all of this. It's a spiritual battle that's going on, underlying everything. So, uh, you know, there, we, we could speculate and talk about that stuff a little more if you want. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. actually working on two new books right now that are going to hit upon this. So, <laughs> uh, wow. you know, so that, that's, it's, oh it's a field God. of study I've been looking at. never going to leave you alone, Wayne. <laughs> Don't tell me it's that. Because okay. I got we got two other books I wanted to interview about too. Um, well, I would say actually, I the atheist thing, yes, that seems to be very intimately linked to intellectuals that are you know experts and out in the mainstream. But I would definitely say, and we don't have to go down this rabbit hole, but I'm seeing a push on Satanism. It, and it's not, it's just, it's not, I feel like it is moving away from atheism and it's focusing more on Satanism. And you just see it. I mean, you see it in music and it's unapologetic now. I mean, the, the, there's one school, I can't remember where, they're, they're actually putting a satanic club for kids. Yeah. Um, you're just seeing it in all these events now. Uh, CERN, the opening ceremonies was just like so bizarre, beyond belief, so satanic. And that's where, you know, they're leveraging those symbols and the occult. Um, but I almost wonder, 
were, are they misinformed? Because I'm not so sure, like, even though they know secrets we don't about the nature of reality, that doesn't necessarily mean they know the right thing either, because I'm not so sure. I, and I, have, you know, I don't have any proof or evidence. I'm just not so sure that it's that easy transhumanism. You know, I'm just, I'm really not that convinced, um, especially since I feel that, you know, we were created by God. And so I, I'm just not sure that, and, and they're very anti that. So how could they really understand how God created us since they're always looking to thwart that and work against that. So if you don't really know what you're trying to push against, can you really understand the inner workings and can you really, you know, invert it so easily as uh, I feel they think, you know, they can, but that's, that could take us on a whole nother, you know, thing, but I, I'm just not so convinced that they're as all, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but you know, as all knowing as right. they believe they are like, yes, you understand a lot of things that you've kept us in the dark about, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true or right. all of it's right or all of it works. Right. So, and and that, that's, that's a true statement. What you said there, uh, just because they, they claim to know something, right. They claim to know a secret and they, they could tell you some, uh, if you actually look in some of this occult philosophy and stuff like that, and uh, how, how they describe how the, you know, the spiritual realms and stuff operate, things like that. Well, there's no way we could verify that, right? No. Neither can they. They don't really know. Uh, but what they can do is they could tinker around with different ideas and different things and see what works and what doesn't. And that's by and large what they've done. So they know what works. They may not understand exactly how it all works, but they know that it works. It's like the same thing with the human body, the human immune system. We know that it works. We don't know how. Not exactly. They, they have some good ideas and they understand, okay, well, if we do this, this will work, right? Like if uh, you have a severe infection and they give you an antibiotic, you will get better. They don't completely understand the mechanism of how that works uh, because, uh, you know, the big secret here with all that is your body always has all this bacteria in you. And sometimes there's good bacteria and sometimes that bacteria turns bad and, uh, you know, can can cause you harm. But most of the time when things are operating efficiently and well, there's no problem. Uh, but uh, the human body heals itself. I mean, a doctor does not heal somebody. Uh, a doctor does not, you know, make somebody better or medicine doesn't make somebody better. The body heals itself and they still don't completely understand how that works. Now they could claim, okay, well, we could uh, see antibodies and white blood cells and all of this stuff. This all combats different bacteria and they have all these theories of how this works. But at the end of the day, nobody really knows, right? We're miraculously made. We're wonderfully yeah, and miraculously made. Is it uh, not true that in our DNA, Yahweh is written in our DNA? Right. I mean, and, and I that's, mean, that's the, the answer. That's the that, answer. That's the thing. I mean, nobody really knows how this all works or even how it came to be. Although they could claim that they know this or that, uh, or they've experimented and they've found some things that work in certain ways. Uh, this is actually a, a, a science called cybernetics, by the way, for anybody yeah, interested. I wanted out to there. talk about that too. It, it's an important thing to understand. It's something that people uh, should come to grips with because when you hear the term cybernetics, you're thinking of like robotics and artificial intelligence and machines and things like that. And that's part of it. But cybernetics in and of itself is nothing more than the science of whole systems control, mm -hmm. controlling whole systems. Like the, uh, the principle, word. underlying right. principle of all the uh, after the aftermath of what things they create to, yeah, sorry. Right. <laughs> no, that, that's fine. And, and that's the thing. Cybernetics is the study of systems control whole systems control. And they, they use this uh, basically to control every type of system there is. It's an opposite way of what we're taught to think. We're taught to compartmentalize everything, right? We think in terms of uh, just look at the subjects, how they teach us in school. You have like math class, science class, all these different things. They, they break down individual ideas into these small sections and keep them disjointed from one another. That's not how cybernetics works. It works on the opposite principle. It looks at the whole system. How does this whole system operate efficiently? And what can we do uh, to make a change in this system in an efficient way? Looking at the whole system. So they, they could learn a little something uh, by using this methodology to look at it. They're not necessarily looking at the constituent parts or components of the system. They're looking at the system as a whole. 
what's the most effective way we could take control of this system? What's the most effective way we could affect this system in some way? And that's what they do. And they, they use this methodology across the board for everything. I mean, you could apply this to human biology. You could apply this to economics. And that's largely one that's been done as well. And uh, I, would, I would caution people, uh, look a little more into economists, who they are and what they do. It's not just about finance. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that wow. much. Economists are, are by and large some of the biggest social controllers and social engineers in this world. Uh, so, you know, uh, when you see somebody mentioning an economist or something, you're thinking, oh, that's a stuffy guy in a tie behind a desk that's sitting there crunching numbers on a calculator and, and coming up with, uh, you know, financial reports for banks and stuff like that. No, it, it goes much further than that, uh, what they do. So, but uh, that's, a, that's a side trail for another day. Uh, but at any rate, the point here is uh, that uh, the cybernetics methodology has been used by these people, and it's kind of an inversion of the natural sciences in a way. Uh, so uh, when they go back to the old natural sciences, they take some of those ideas and they twist them and manipulate them in a way uh, where they're able to control these systems, right? They could take control of systems using some of these different principles. So uh, a good way to think of cybernetics, a, a good example I could give, is the concept of what's called homeopathy, right? Like the human body operates in a certain uh, fashion to keep itself in a homeostatic state, a state of balance, right? So uh, a good analogy for that would be like a thermostat. Think of a thermostat. It controls the temperature in a house, right? So if it's, if it's too cold in the house, the heat will kick on. And then once the, uh, the, heat, the temperature in the room or whatever comes up to that temperature, the, the furnace shuts off, right? The thermostat controls that. Uh, or air conditioning, like the, the other way. If it's too warm, air conditioner will kick on and circulate cool air until the temperature cools down enough, and then it'll kick off. This is a cybernetic uh, system. It's a feedback mechanism, right? So uh, it takes an input, analyzes the input, and looks for that homeostatic balance in the system. And then it creates that homeostatic, what it needs to create to, to go back to that homeostatic balance in the system. And this is how it works. So uh, they could use this, this principle, this feedback mechanism to take control of a system too by uh, introducing an outside input into the system. And this is what's called a causal circuit, creates a causal circuit. Uh, so if they input something new into the system, they could create a, uh, a chain reaction through the entire system and get an, a certain output from it. So once they figure out what the output is from the certain input that they put in, well, then they figured out how the feedback loop works and they could manipulate that feedback loop, right? So uh, in, in using feedback loops in this way, they could hijack a system and take control of it, uh, you know, in, in principle here. And that's what they've done with a lot of these different, uh, you know, things that we do in society, right down to human biology and uh, even, you know, uh, sociology, the human brain. Uh, they, they use this in psychology in many ways. They'll input something new in the system, and it's usually some kind of a fear mechanism, right? So by inputting this in the system, they create a reaction within the system, and they could measure the output of that reaction. And once they get an accurate measurement of that output, they'll know how they could tweak or adjust the settings on the fear input they're putting in to uh, get the uh, reaction that they want. Uh, so that's that's kind of how they control human behavior in a way, too. It's a cybernetics principle. And I said, you could apply this to any system at all, anything, and it works. And they figured this out, and they don't want people to understand that or think in that way. And that's why they keep our minds fragmented like they do. That's why they teach us, okay, well, you're a specialist in this. Like, you go to your doctor. There's a foot doctor, right, <laughs> that understand, just works with feet. That's one part of the human body. And, and this is part and parcel of what goes on. It's called compartmentalization. And it happens uh, throughout all of the power structure too. I think even within mind control immediately because that's the end goal yep. to compartmentalize your mind, you know, it's right. little cones and- They hide. don't want you to think outside of that one little specialization, right? They don't want you to think in that way. Uh, like, uh, for example, like I said about economists, they want you to think in terms of, okay, and an economist is somebody that just sits and crunches numbers all day and is worried about money. 
that's part of it, but they do so much more. <laughs> and, and that's kind of, uh, you know, why they have specializations and stuff like that. They've taught us to go to college, learn a trade or learn, you know, a particular, uh, um, gender studies. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's one of them. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. That's, uh, you know, all about creating more confusion. Uh, thousand dollars later. <laughs> yep. -er. And uh, what, what do they do? I mean, what kind of a job do you get with a gender studies degree? You, you I, know, I don't know. You get the moral high ground, Wayne. That's what is that what it is? Okay. It's worth every penny. The moral high ground. Okay. <laughs> the perceived moral high ground. Yeah, yeah. Or at least they, they would have liked to think so. Or they'll tell you so that they have the moral high ground. Yeah. Oh so. yeah. They'll tell you over and over again that they have yep. the moral high ground. Um, so another thing I want and I brought it up before was the well, this whole idea of worshiping nature. So like paganism, things like that. Now, and this is just me. When I look to nature, I say, when you just let nature do what it's supposed to do, not control it, not, you know, keep it in a habitat, it balances itself out beautifully. Animals just seem to know like what you're saying about fear you know, they might have a moment of fear, but then, the, you know, it, it, it escalates. And then once it's over, it just slowly dissipates. And it's like nothing ever happened. It was like a lion wasn't chasing me five minutes ago, trying to literally kill me. Um, you know, so I, I, I love animals for that reason, because I feel like you, you watch an animal and you just learn so much that like they're in the moment. They, you know, they say that they've rescued actually a lot of natural habitats by simply just bringing back the, the animals that were, you know, naturally in that environment and they just make every, bring everything back into balance. But this paganist perspective puts nature over spirituality, I suppose, or, you know, looks more into the physical. So I'm curious to know, like, how is that bad? Cause like, I'm not saying I think it's good, but how is that bad? Because to me, nature holds a lot of the keys to the answers of what we're doing all wrong, but yet like they seem to be distorting that as, a, as an ideology, like of na worshiping nature. And, and I guess, how does that tie into what we're saying about the age of Aries and then moving in, you know, Pisces and then moving into. All right, well, that, that's, that's a big question uh, to yeah. unpack here. Well, first of all, we can learn an awful lot about, uh, about nature and about the natural world by observing nature. We could learn a lot about how this place we live in, how it operates. We could learn a lot about God by observing his creation, right? By observing nature. Now, uh, what has happened is uh, in the very earliest ages of man, when man was uh, you know, a little more in tune with nature than what we are now, he observed many of these things going on and made observations and, and key points about this and was able to come up with uh, symbolic ideas and stuff based upon this. And uh, this became misconstrued uh, through the eras and through the generations uh, by people looking backwards in time at this and uh, coming up with the concept that these people worshiped nature. Well, that wasn't necessarily the case. And this is what we're still taught to this day. And that's not necessarily true. Uh, these people didn't necessarily like worship nature or the thing that they adopted as a symbol representing some spiritual truth of some sort or something. Uh, they didn't really do that. Although we're, we're told this is uh, what the this old societies and stuff did. And a lot of this ties directly back to what we call the mystery schools of antiquity, because many of these different uh, mythological systems and or religions, they adopted some of these ideas. And uh, what they did is they tried to convince the outer courts of the people, the, the outer uh, members, so to say, of said religion or group, they convinced them that the symbol was actually representative of the thing that they, they were looking at here, right? So uh, I don't know if I'm explaining this in, in just the right words here. Well, what uh, is but, the symbol? Like, for instance, Pan, maybe we could we could go. You know, let's, let's, let's start with something simple people will okay. understand first, because it's said that uh, many of these old cults or religions or mythologies are all based upon the worship of the sun, right? Well, see, that's the thing. Early on, man adopted the, the sun as the symbol of the unseen God in this place. 
uh, because it, it, it gave us light and warmth and heat and uh, is everything that, that generates life here on earth. They understood this. So they used this as a symbol to represent God. And here's where the misconstruing went on, is that the mystery schools, uh, these were some of the more learned people that learned uh, some of the secrets about how astrology works and things like that. They convinced the masses that uh, what was being done here was all about just the symbol itself, the creation itself. Uh, so they had people worshiping aspects of the creation just in the outer circles of this thing, uh, in the inner circles of the religious groups and stuff like that, or, or the mythological uh, groups, they understood it's, it's a symbol, okay? It represents a higher idea, but uh, many of the unsophisticated people who couldn't read or write or something like that, they were just, you know, okay with telling them, here's what you do. Uh, you go out and you make a sacrifice at such and such a time and stuff like that, just to appease them and to get them to bring tribute uh, to what they would call later the, the priest craft, right? Uh, so that, that's what it is, what it's about, is you had a small group of people that decided they wanted control and power over others. So they took some of these symbols and represented them to the outer masses of the people as the actual God, mm. per se. So people early on in the very earliest stages of humanity, they, they didn't really go out outside and think, wow, look at that giant flaming ball in the sky. That's God. We're going to worship that. That's not how they thought, right? They saw it. They observed nature. They were more close to nature than what we are. They watched how all this worked and wondered at the, you know, the being that made all of this, the creator. And then they, uh, in order to best convey ideas, to one another, they adopted symbols for these different things. So the sun represented God in his glory, right? So that's kind of how they uh, communicated these ideas early on. But this was all hijacked by this priestcraft within these mystery schools. They took these ideas and convoluted them and brought them forward to the masses to have them believe this is what you worship, right? This is, you know, the sun is God, uh, you know, this this, uh, this sacred cow out here, this is a type of God uh, you need to appease and this and that for other things, because they understood some of the natural cycles of how things worked. And your average farmer didn't really truly understand that at that point, like they were able to predict eclipses and stuff like this. So they used this kind of knowledge to manipulate people and make them believe they had some special knowledge of God or some special relationship with this God. And they convinced that the people this is the God we worship. It's the sun or whatever. So they use these symbols to uh, manipulate the masses. And that's why coming forward through history, right? And looking back on this, we see it and we're taught that the, these ancient cults and stuff, they, they worshiped the sun and they worshiped animals and they worshiped the creation. And that's not necessarily the case. That wasn't the, uh, at the initial heart of all of it, right? Most people understood, okay, this is symbolic of something else, but they did what the priestcraft told them because they seemed to have more knowledge of certain things than the average person. So they thought they were more uh, godly, uh, so to say, or more pious or had a closer relationship with this uh, invisible God. And uh, so the priestcraft manipulated this in people and got them to where they, they uh, put the uh, these different concepts on a, on a pedestal, so to say. So like they, they would do like they, this solar worship and stuff like this. Uh, and, you know, when we look back at the, the artifacts and stuff and, you know, all the things we find relating to this, well, that's what we're implied to think. These people worship the sun. Look at, they have the iconography of the sun all over the place and stuff like that. Not understanding Urban. the underlying symbols, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what happened. You had this, this small group that was the, the priestcraft at that point uh, within these different mystery school uh, places that to a kind of uh, steered people along these lines and kept the real secrets from them while passing down the esoteric secrets uh, through their different orders or brotherhoods that came forward to become the secret societies through the years. So uh, they kept a lot of this, this symbology hidden from mankind because it's an archetypal symbology and they could use it to control people. And they, they figured that out early on. So that's why they wanted to keep people oblivious as to the true nature of God. So they would tell him the sun in the sky, well, this is God. And if you don't uh, do 
what we tell you being the representatives of God, well, we'll make the sun disappear from the sky on such and such a date at such and such a time. And that's when the eclipse would happen because they learned how to read the sky clock, the, the stars and stuff very early on. So they used this knowledge against the uneducated masses and they were impelled to believe what they were told by this priestcraft. And that's how a lot of this stuff came about. Uh, so, you know, when we look back on it now, we see, okay, were these people really that dumb? Did they really think that, you know, they were worshiping the sun, that the sun was an actual, uh, you know, being or something that uh, uh, they were trying to appease or something like that? I don't think that's the case. I think people were a lot smarter back then than we give them credit for. But I think they understood just certain things and uh, thought that uh, this this group of authorities, the authority figures, the, the mystery school class, the the priests, the priestcraft, that they knew something more that they understood something better and that they should listen to the authority. So this is where all these ideas come from, right? I mean, they how set is that any up. different than masks? It's not. Exactly. It's the same thing going on today. The exact same thing. Same thing going on today. It's just, uh, we have a more modern interpretation of these yes. things. But uh, it's it, that's exactly what it's all about. So uh, these this priestcraft in the beginning that set themselves up with these mystery school teachings throughout all the world, they understood uh, that this is a way that they could have prominence. They could keep some kind of secret information from the masses and use it to control them in some way, shape, or form. And that's what they've done. And they set themselves up as these authority figures. So whatever they said goes, right? So uh, that, that's how they positioned themselves. And it's been the same group of ruling families throughout all of history, uh, as far back as we could look with a lot of this stuff. Uh, who've done this. And it all ties back to that whole idea. So, uh, I mean, when you look at this concept, okay, it may sound a little ridiculous to us today, but this is absolutely what's been done. And it's still going on. It's yeah, still going on. Making different shapes and forms and, you know, right. this order out of chaos thing. Yeah, yeah. I think we didn't get to the pan part of it, though. We, we do that. need well, to touch on yeah, that. Yeah, so I guess but, I could say to you then why, and maybe this will come into play, but why do they want to skip over the age of man? Like, you know, we're, we were in the age of Pisces, which you said was relating to God, I believe, or Christ. Right, right. Um, right. Well, why do they want, like, we were in the, we were in Ram, then we were in Christ, now we're entering man. Why do they want to go from man to what is it, Capricorn? Where Capricorn it's, again? It's that pan, type right? Of, um, well, well, here's the thing. It's 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 an archetypal idea. All right. Uh, when it comes down to it, if you go back and you look at any of these occult studies, uh, you'll invariably come across something called astrotheology, and this is where a lot of the modern movements, like Theosophy, claim that most of our religions and religious ideas and stuff came from astrotheology, the study of the stars, right? Uh, the, the ancient priestcraft in the mystery schools, they studied the stars. They came up with stories about the stars, the different constellations, things like this. Uh, they identified the zodiac and laid all this stuff out. And, uh, and they I love claim, that stuff, I have to say. So yeah, right. I'm interested because you have the water, you have air, you have fire, you have earth. And now they're trying to bring us back to earth from what would be air, which is what more spirituality, I think you had mentioned. Air. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I these, these the are spiritual realm. Yeah, these like this is a lot of ideas to unpack in a like yeah. a short session here. Uh, so th this is something that takes a lot of years of study to really truly comprehend. But uh, when you look at the zodiac signs, there's there's different types of signs. You have your four philosophical basic elements: earth, air, fire, and water. Right. Well, it's these are foundational principles of how metaphysics works in this place, right? Or what we would call metaphysics. What would be more uh, accurately described as either uh, alchemy or as uh, natural sciences. See, these were things that have been uh, understood from as far back as we could go by ancient man and stuff like that. They figured out these different concepts, how this stuff worked in the natural world, right? So uh, they understood uh, on a different level than what we do today because we're so far removed from nature, uh, these concepts a little better. Uh, and they're, they're philosophical concepts. So it's not to say like, you know, if you apply this physically, it's going to necessarily work how they say or something like that. It's, we're not talking about the physical. So this is where it, it becomes difficult for some people because you have to think in a different way. You have to think outside of the box you were taught to think in. Uh, so we're talking about a philosophical concept here when we're talking about the four elements. There's earth, air, fire, and water. Now, uh, 
the age of Aries is largely equated with the Hebrew religion, right? Uh, so you have Aries, the ram, that's why they, they worship the golden calf and all of that stuff. Uh, and then when Christ came, this became the age of Pisces and there was this crossover point uh, from what we would consider more of the uh, pagan type uh, religious ideals, the, the worship of nature, so to say, because that's essentially what they describe pagan as, is the worship of nature, which I don't think was necessarily an accurate description, but uh, that's essentially what they've tried to describe it as to us, to our, our modern parlance, our modern lens of history. So you take those pagan ideas where they were, you know, worshiping the creation, the, the different animals, the, you know, the, the ram, uh, which is also the goat, right? Uh, so they, they, they had that. <laughs> So yeah, so they, they had that, and then came uh, the advent of Christ, okay, and this, this was the uh, start of the age of Pisces. So we had this crossover from uh, what I would call uh, this nature worship, or the pan ideal, and there's where the pan symbol comes in, to Christ, right? The fish, Christ is always represented in symbology by a fish. Uh, ichthys, I think is, you know, uh, it was a symbol by, used by the early Christians to identify one another the fish. Uh, so this is a, a symbol that's uh, taken root as a, a, a symbol for Christ. And adorns so, uh, many a car bumper. <laughs> yeah, it, it has. Uh, so like this is an understood concept here. So we have what I, I named the pan Christ dynamic going on when you have the switch over between ages, because what happened at the time of Christ, uh, it was the, uh, the switch over from this natural type worship to something a little bit higher minded, right? A, a higher uh, type of an ideal, a more spiritual type ideal, shifting from looking at the physical nature of things to uh, the, the more spiritual side. So uh, we have that crossover point and we're going through something similar today, but we're going through the inversion of that today because they're saying we're in the age of Pisces and we're switching to the age of Aquarius, which in the cycle of the Zodiac is next in line. In Aquarius is said to be the age of man, or what is intended to be the fulfillment of these different Christ ideals, right? The, the full manifestation of such, of humanity living up to its full potential. Uh, so that's what we would equate to what they call the Great Awakening, right? That's what's going on. That's what's supposed to be going on through the natural course of time here. Well, what has happened is they, we, these dark occultists in places of power here in this world are trying to leverage uh, this archetype this pan archetype, once again, to shift things back into the material type phase of things, thinking in the more physical rather than the more spiritual. Uh, so that's what they've done. They've taken a hold of this idea, this concept of pan, and they're using it as an inversion of what's going on now uh, to replace this great awakening idea with what they call the great reset, right? And in so doing, what they're doing is they're trying to essentially bypass the energies that are inherent in the Aquarian age and skipping ahead to what the age of Capricorn would be. Capricorn, once again, is the goat. Uh, so you see, this is a direct homage back to the pan ideal. And Capricorn is an earth age, right? Whereas Pisces was a water age and uh, Aquarius is an air age. So air, air and fire always represent the spiritual uh, as far as uh, in the, the four philosophical el elements and water and earth always represent the physical. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to uh, capture the consciousness of man, right? Or the uh, man's mind, so to say, and keep it bound in material, the material world, rather than thinking in more spiritual terms and elevating spiritually. So uh, with that being the case, um, this is what's being leveraged here as an archetype there. They're shifting back to that pan idea, pan being associated with the goat or the ram. So pan was the ram back in the age of Aries. And now he's the goat in the age of Capricorn. And we see all the goat symbolism all over the place uh, that they've been telegraphing to us the past few years, haven't we? Uh, it's, it's always, they're always talking about the goat, the greatest of all time, right? You see that trope going on in society. There's a reason for these things. Uh, you look, uh, you mentioned earlier about the, the thing with CERN, uh, with the, uh, the Gothard Tunnel opening ceremony there. Um, it, it was all about goat symbolism, all of it. And uh, it's a very important occult symbol. And it's the inversion of the idea that was in the age of Aries, which was on an elevating type of a, a, a trajectory. Whereas this is a, a, a trajectory going downward now. 
is where they're trying to take us because see we're in a, a place in the cycle of time where we should be elevating and thinking of loftier things and moving on advancing spiritually but they're trying to trap us in this hyper materialist viewpoint and that's essentially the energy that they're trying to invoke here and that's why it's important to think in terms of archetypes as like concepts right because that's what's encapsulated in this pan idea uh, so they're trying to shift us back to this pan idea and this pan idea in the modern age is represented a little bit differently than it was back in the previous age there, back in Aries time. Uh, because when you think of Pan, the Greek god, right? Well, he was a man with goat's legs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the modern equivalent of that, the inversion of it, yep, that's Pan right there. But the modern equivalent of that, the inversion, is Baphomet, right? He's got the goat's head. It's an inversion. They're inverting the principle. So they're taking the idea of uh, shifting from a lower place to a high place and inverting it from going to a higher place down to a lower place and keeping us bound in the material here. Uh, so that's what it's about. It's, it's a different way of thinking about things. Uh, and it's something that may be a little, you know, a bridge too far for some people. But uh, it's definitely something these people in these uh, circles of power understand and are utilizing against the masses here. So that being the case, like I said, whether you believe any of this stuff or not, it's immaterial. What you need to understand is there's people in positions of power in this world that very much believe this stuff and are using it in certain ways. And the things they do with it will affect us all. So that's the, that's the bottom line with that. And I just, oh, Wayne, I could talk to you forever, but um, the Pied Piper, you know, that, that's, that whole story was just so interesting because it is like luring right you know how they lowered the rats down to the river and they drowned i feel like that's kind of what's going on right now you know we're being very there's a definite uh attempt to seduce us to just surrender our sovereignty to these people you know we're you're going to be a god you know i can't remember the guy's name uh who, he's all over the place he's everybody's thought leader like obama's because he's a, an interesting <laughs> name but he's, you know, saying how we'll, you know, and you touched on this God is dead uh, declaration. <laughs> but oh, Nietzsche, times. yeah. Yeah, that, well, yeah. But just like the, the headline saying God is dead, it's kind of like they're echoing the sentiment now saying, well, we don't need, like we have, we made our own technological cloud. So, <laughs> you know, that cloud up in the clouds where God supposedly is, no, he's down here now. We can be God. We, are, we can now, uh, right. you know, and th this to me is like that Pied Piper, like, come on, oh, it sounds really good, doesn't it? Come on, follow me, you know, and, and, and there's people who are biting and there's people who are, I think, just putting their heads in the sand. I think it's mostly though the heads in the sand. So that that's good, at least, <laughs> because if yeah. we try to take it out <laughs> one day, we stand a chance, you know, but, and, and this consent thing, I, I just want to bring that back home again, too, because a lot of people will say, well, they're so powerful. You know, they have all the money, they have all the, you know, control over everything, but not so because people like that, if they could do what they wanted to do tomorrow, they would do it. There's no reason why the, you know, they're not going to hesitate. It's, you know, they're, they're going to do it, but there's a reason why they can't. And it's right. because we have to allow them to. Right. And, you know, I wish more people would understand that because we've been that's, indoctrinated into this little me right and, and that's know, that's part of the social of engineering that's part of the social engineering they want you to believe you're an infinitesimally small piece of dust in a, a giant cosmic universe and that uh, it all came about by accident and you're nothing you're not special you have no power you're a nobody uh, and that, that's why uh, you know we have these different uh, types of uh, models we're given in society uh, that, we, that we're given ideas like the big bang theory and stuff like that well that just tells you uh you know uh, that there was nothing and then one day nothing exploded and became everything and uh you know we're just floating around on this giant space rock flying around through space at half a million miles an hour and uh it all came about by accident and you're, you're not special you're nothing that couldn't be further from the truth uh that that's the whole point we have a lot more power than they want us to know that we have they need us far more than we need them. Yes. We're the ones that uh, are actually the creative force in this place, right? Uh, your average person it's, is the innovator, the one that comes up with new things, creates new things, 
actually gets the job done. These people sitting in positions of power, they don't know how to do anything for themselves. They just know how to manipulate others or steal others' ideas and use them, right? So that's what's going on. They need us more than we need them. And they know that if we ever figure that out, they're in big, deep trouble. And that's why they socially engineer us in the way they do and want us to think very little of ourselves and uh, think that we don't have any power to change anything, that they're oh so powerful, they control all this stuff. Well, here's the thing. I mean, look at society around us. Look at all the businesses the past year that have shut their doors because they, they can't get anybody to work, right? We, we've seen this. Like, the people have left the, the job market in droves. They're gone from it. They decided, and I think this was an unintended side effect of all this stuff that they've done. They didn't think people would figure out if they left, uh, you know, if they locked them in their house and said, you can't go to work, we're shutting down essential business, non-essential businesses and all this stuff. They didn't think people would figure out some other way to get by, right? They figured they would just need to uh, lean on government assistance or something. Well, people began to innovate, didn't they? And they discovered, you know what? I'm tired of being undervalued, working for somebody else, making money for somebody else who doesn't value my time or my commitment. Uh, so I'm going to go do something to better my own situation, right? So we've had this happen. And then you have all these businesses that can't fill enough positions. They, they have all these uh, openings and nobody will work at them. And we've seen the escalation of, uh, you know, through even prior to the whole pandemic situation, people were crying for $15 an hour minimum wage and stuff like this. Well, now they've got that. And then some, these jobs that were paying minimum wage are now offering people $15 plus an hour to work there and people still won't fill the position. This was an unintended consequence of all of this. People figured out there's a better way to do things. Like, why am I going through this, this whole corporate uh, structure like this? Why am I, why am I falling into this trap? See, because that's the thing. They gave people time to think. Uh, I think that was their big mistake here when they did all this, right? People, by and large, okay, they, they tried using their fear programming to control people. It succeeded to a certain degree, but uh, they drug it out way too long. Mm. I think that was their big mistake. They drug it out way too greedy. long. And yeah, they got greedy with it. They thought, this is great. We were getting it far less pushback than we were expecting with it. Uh, so they pushed the envelope further and further and further, and they, they drug it out too long. And that gave people time to think and evaluate what's going on and understanding there's deception here, right? And figuring out, you know what? I survived through this without my job that I was depending on. I found another way and I'm actually doing better than I was. Why do I want to go back to that lifestyle of stress and aggravation and, uh, you know, work for pitlings? Well, somebody else makes all the money, right? Uh, so people figured this out and they by and large stepped away from the job market. So we see as a result of that, a lot of these businesses wound up closing their doors or you know, changing around the way they do business to make them more profitable uh, because of this type of a thing, because there's no workforce anymore. I mean, we see that all across the country right now. Mm -hmm. There's just like, it, it's decimated the economy. Uh, to the point where people just, they don't want to work now because why, why do they want to go do that, right? Because they, they've, they've figured out they could survive <laughs> anyway, regardless of whether they have that or not. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of this actually goes along with a, a social engineering trope as well, uh, the whole uh, idea of a universal basic income. But uh, people... See Which that Elon coming. Musk is in favor of, by the way. Oh, yeah. The, yeah, all oh. these guys are. Why wouldn't they be? I mean, think about it. I mean, here's here's your stipend. Oh, by the way, if you want to if you want to keep us giving you this money every month, you have to listen to what we say. You could only buy X amount of things with it or, uh, you know, you, you you should go get your 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 covid shot if you want to keep this money coming in. That, that kind of thing. That'll be coming with it, too. And, uh, you know, along with that, a digital ID and a, a social credit score and everything uh, will all be aligned with this whole situation and this whole setup. But uh, that's kind of what they've been engineering in a certain way with people with a lot of these ideas. But people figured out, I don't want to have to go do the nine to five job thing anymore, right? I, I rather enjoyed having more free time and I was still able to survive. So I'm going to figure out something else. So that's what the, a lot of them have done. And many of them are have collected unemployment and stuff too. 
and had no incentive to go back to work either. Uh, so this creates a kind of ripple effect through the whole economy. And, and they know this and they planned for a, a portion of it, but I don't think they understood the full implications of what they were doing, how people were going to start to see through it and decide, I don't want to go back to a corporate job like that. I'm going to try and do something different. And, uh, you know, the avenues have, have opened up for creativity in so many ways for people uh, because it, they've had this free time now to actually sit and think and pursue the things that they like. Uh, so, you know, man being innovative as he is, he'll find a way to make it work. And that's what we've done uh, by and large. So, uh, you know, it was an unintended consequence, I think, for them that this happened. And now they're just trying to adapt on the fly with all of it. Uh, so, you know, I, I do see the, the advent of universal basic income rolling out at some point here, though. Uh, yeah. that's, that's part of the plan by and large, because th that's one way they can decimate the economy more. <laughs> so, and that's, yeah, that's, exactly. that's the whole plan. They want to change up the currency. They want to go all digital with the currency and make it a one world currency. Uh, and where so have we scary. heard that before? So scary. Goodness. I mean, well... Crypto, I don't know the whole crypto thing to me. I mean, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. I just think that's a Trojan horse. And once again, the alternative media just gloms onto it. And a lot of really smart financial minds just, I don't know if they're in on it or not, but it's just like, oh my God, really? You really think this is the, I mean, if they're going to control all the switches. Right. That's, doesn't that's matter the problem. How much of this stuff that you have, it makes no difference, you know? Um, and also it's just, it's so absurd to me, like it, you're paying thousands of dollars for something in the ether. It's no more absurd than, than the, than the, the bills we use, you know, the notes right. we use because it's all perceptual value. There's no inherent value, you know, intrinsic value. It's just perceptual. We all agree that this dollar is valuable. We all agree that this hundred dollar bill is valuable and that's, you know, that could take us back to the perception right. is reality, which we're hopefully starting to catch on to that. No, the physical world doesn't relay back our reality. Our minds are the ones that, and you touch on that, you know, in your book. Um, it's just, it's so absurd. I, I just can't, you know, with the, the passports and Oh, yeah. I mean, and the digital currency is all part of that as well. That's why they've been trying to normalize the idea of cryptocurrency here. Yeah, uh, because but it's, they're they, they do have plans like, for it. But it's so funny because it's, it's the, like the Elon Musk thing, you know, right. it's like crypto versus the bad guys. And it's like, really? It's an illusion. It's yeah, an illusion. They set up these like polarities, these, you know, right. like good versus bad and you know uh everybody's always trying to find a hack for something you know so crypto's the hack you know because when right. they, they pull the switch it's but you know what about our our friend uh klaus schwab who keeps you know this cryptic prediction about a cyber attack Yep. <laughs> you know, oh, we're, that's not planned or anything. No, you know, we are really afraid for this cyber attack from Russia yes, or whatever. Yes, you know, cyber like, COVID. <laughs> yeah, it's like, so what do you think is going to happen then? You know, uh, I, I feel like that is something, though, they really have to weigh out because once that happens, it's like we're back to caveman time. It's going to be savagery. Like if they just crash everything it's not going to be pretty. It's going to be very scary world to live in. And I, I'm, trust me, if I could go back in time, cause I grew up in a time without all this technology, I would do it in a heartbeat. I mean, it's wonderful. I get to talk to people like you and, you know, get to find people like you in the ether somewhere. But right. if I could go back, I would in a heartbeat, I would say, let's just roll it back. This yep. never existed. Cause it's too much of a Pandora's box. That's but, that's the problem with it. It yeah. is it's Pandora's box, and once it's let loose, there's no you putting can, it back in the box. And no, it's not like you can be like, "Oh, we'll keep the internet, but but we won't have uh, smartphones." Like, no, it would it would happen. It would be a self fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, I think, hey, crash it, great. But they have to understand that if you decide to do that, your all bets are off. I mean, people uh, will storm the castle. You are not. Oh, yeah. You know, it's it's not gonna it's not going to work out for anybody because every single thing that you own is now in that interwebs 
And if right. it's just shut off and erased, I really don't see that problem reaction solution going the way they would like, like, oh, I lost all my money. Okay, I guess I'll get a, a digital wallet. You know, like, no, that's not gonna happen. No. You know? That's like Bernie Madoff on steroids. It's just not gonna happen, <laughs> you know, if you wanna do this globally. So I'm interested, you know, and I, I'm wondering if this is a whole Oedipal thing. You know what I'm saying? Where if you try to thwart the age of man, are you just going to actually make it happen even more? Well, if you want my honest opinion, I think these uh, controllers and positions of power in this world are deceiving themselves. It's not going yeah. to happen. Uh, they're not going to be able to break the cycle of time like they want. They're not going to be able to break the natural order. Uh, this place works on natural laws. Our creator made this place and it operates in, uh, you know, the under all these different uh, natural laws in which it does. Uh, and man has never truly been able to violate these natural laws. We live by them. And yeah, maybe we do uh, not obey the natural law, but we pay the consequence for that down the road. Uh, like if you look at the way our technologies work, they work in opposition or inversion to the natural world. When you look at, uh, say, something as simple as a combustion engine, it's a destructive device. It's using a destructive force to create power. Whereas if you look at the work of like somebody like a Victor Schauberger, uh, this was uh, actually like a vortex engine he created uh, that used water because he studied water. And this works with the natural environment. It works with natural energies. And it's a creative force rather than a destructive force. Uh, so that's what uh, these people in positions of power are all about. They're all about using destructive forces. That's why it, I say it's a death cult. It is. It's all about death. It's these death ideas, this inversion principle. It underlies everything. See, they're trying to create a new reality inside this one that's a complete inversion of the natural world. They want to be the gods of this place. And the only way they could do that is by creating an inverse system to what's here. Uh, and that's what their aim and their goal is. But I could tell you, uh, I fervently believe they're going to fail because you cannot uh, stab off these natural forces for a, any length of time without uh, consuming, consuming massive amounts of energy uh, because of simple natural principles like entropy, uh, you know, where all things decay over time. So uh, if you set up this type of a control structure, think about that. Like if, if they, they talk about setting up these smart cities and these smart city grids and all of this, think about the infrastructure that has to be in place and be constantly maintained, right? Think about the energy challenges of maintaining a structure like that. Because if you let a building go and walk away for like a year, you'll come back, it'll be overgrown, there'll be vines, there'll be things invariably crumbling away from the building and and this is what nature does. Nature always self-corrects everything. Uh, so that being the case, that natural principle, that natural law will still be operating. So in order to keep that natural law at bay, it will require a massive amount of maintenance and it'll be beyond the scope of what they'll be able to maintain. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I see this as they're, they're desperate, right? These people in positions of power they're desperate for what they want and they see it as being feasible with the technologies we have today. And they're really pushing for it and they're gonna try, but I think ultimately they're going to fail. And uh, I, I think they realize that, but they're going for it anyway, because it's their only chance. Uh, so yeah, and they'll try and take as many of us out with this whole thing as they possibly can, just to kind of spit in the face of the creator, uh, because that's what it's about. They want to become the gods of this place. They want to take the place of the creator. And this, this invokes back to uh, the archetype of the Tower of Babel story. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, when you look back at that, what happened is uh, King Nimrod, he gathered all the people together. They built a grand city and they built a tower to reach in, into the heavens. And his plan was to climb to the top of this tower and slay God and take his place, Right. So this is the allegory that's put forward by that tale. Well, what happened in that tale of the Tower of Babel? God destroyed the tower and confused the language, right? So uh, that's what happened. And then everybody scattered again and repopulated the world. So that's what will happen. We'll come to this Tower of Babel moment. So even if they succeed on some level with the things they have planned with this transhumanist singularity, it'll be very short-lived. <laughs> I can assure you of that. Uh, because they will hit that Tower of Babel moment once again. So uh, what will happen is uh, 
it'll come crumbling down in a catastrophic way because this is always always what happens in violation of natural law does yeah i mean it's it's a violation of natural law and uh it'll it'll come down in a very real supernatural type way uh where this will crumble like catastrophically the whole system that they build it'll crumble catastrophically because it'll collapse under the weight of its own mass so to say uh because of the natural principles involved so uh you know that's how judgment will be passed on that and uh, we could see the allegory of the confused languages and stuff again too and this ties back to the etymological idea we opened the show with here uh, about how words have meaning and uh, if you look back at the roots of the language and understand the words we say today have very different meanings than what the original word that they're derived from did uh, and this is utilized uh, you know a way by these uh, dark occultists as an archetype or an archetypal idea so uh, when, when you see this stuff you could understand a little better when you get back to the roots of what the words mean and how it's been leveraged against us in that way it's the same principle and that falls back on this confusion of languages too yeah i mean it's it's just so interesting uh you know one thing god gave us was free will and i think the whole in my opinion just my opinion the reason why we're now in the situation we're in and everybody's like why is this happening you know is because essentially we've abdicated that in the minute i think that's just the fundamental root of all of this is when yep. you you abdicate your personal sovereignty the greatest gift you were given it leads to enslavement there's no way around it you know when you choose to turn your mind off and believe in uh, sorry i don't mean to start preaching but i just think it's so important people understand because it's very simple it's not i think we see it as like how do we defeat the world economic forum how do we defeat who how do we do you know it's like no it, that's that's not to me that's not where it lot the challenge lies the challenge lies in taking your mind back because you right. can sit back and say they tricked us they lied to us they no you put them on the pedestal to put yourself to be vulnerable enough to and, and you see this in the bible you see this in every age-old story when you start to believe in false idols when you start to place your whole sovereignty in their hands everything falls apart you know inherently we were given this gift it's so precious of free will and we're just like eh, i'm gonna look at my smartphone and <laughs> shut everything off and so you know and yep. there's god or whatever higher power people believe in you know i totally respect that tapping you on the shoulder and now saying okay now this is getting out of hand like we need to whoop, you know and then i think that's another traumatic thing people are so afraid they're clinging to yep. these traditional institution of powers like well we can change the schools we can change it's like no <laughs> when when we get this far it does have to be like a sodom and gomorrah type you know you just got to tear the whole, and, and it, I, I'm not happy about that because that's very traumatic and it's, and where do you go from there? But you just got to rip it, the root out and start over again. Right. And I, I think that leads. <laughs> there's a lot that goes with that whole idea too. Uh, I, I would start by telling people the only mind you can change is your own, right? Uh, the best we could do is present information to people and let them make a decision for themselves because that's the thing. We have this free will principle, this, this gift that was given to us by, by God. We're given this free will principle. Now, with this free will principle comes some responsibility as well. And we abdicate our free will and our responsibility to someone else and let them think for us, do the thinking for us, right? And that's part and parcel of what's going on. And we just turn a blind eye and are complacent. Ah, that's above my pay grade, right? I'm not going to worry about that. That's what, you know, we hired this guy or elected this guy to go to, right? Exactly. Uh, so, you know, you abdicate your own personal responsibility. And with that goes a little bit of your freedom and your free will as well when you do that. And that, that's a principle that's not lost on the occultists that run this place. Uh, but, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, we as individuals have to step up and take responsibility. And I think that's part of the problem in our society today is people think, that they're, if they just sit back and be quiet, all this, this too shall pass. And I won't have to ever step up into that position where I have to make this difficult decision or this difficult choice. That's not the case. Uh, we're all at some point going to have to come to account for things. 
And we're going to have to make these hard decisions, each and every one of us individually, right? So it, it's, it's coming down to that point. There's not going to be any, uh, I'll just sit back and let this whole issue pass us by. And then, you know, eventually when it calms down, everything will be okay. And I will have avoided the conflict and everything with that. That's not the case. That's not what it is. We're in a very real spiritual battle right now. And we all have to make that decision on an individual level because we're all going to be affected by it on a personal level very soon here. Yeah. Uh, so there's only so long you could be one of those fence post sitters, right? Uh, trying to sit somewhere between sides on the issue and, and hope that it just passes you by. It's not going to. It's getting down to brass tacks now. It's to the point where we're all going to have to either stand our ground or crumble to it. And you're going to make that decision. You're, you come to the crossroads. You have to decide which way are you going. There's no, uh, no more stalling that decision. We're running out of time as far as that goes. So, uh, they know you know, that. that's, that's the important thing here. You're not going to skirt this whole thing, right? And a lot of people seem to think that uh, if they just sit quietly by and let other people worry about it and take care of it, well, this will bypass them. Uh-uh, that's not how it works. It's an individual journey and we all have to face it and go through it. We all have to stand before it and uh, decide what we're gonna do with it all. And you know, when it comes down to uh, the transhumanist ideal, that's coming, whether we want it or not. And we're gonna have to make a decision at some point. So you know, if it comes down to, uh, you need to throw away your smartphone, are you gonna do it? Like uh, that, that's the bottom line. I mean, I know they've purposely made them addictive and stuff, purposely to hook you and okay. a lot of people are, are to that point right a lot of people are to that point where you know they, they are hooked on it and they don't want to give it up it's become such an intricate uh, part of their life uh, all, all these different technologies and that's what they're depending on to get people on the hook with all of this yeah. but uh, it's going to come down to a spiritual decision are you going to step away from it because you know something's not right with it or are you just going to go along with it and hope that it all passes you by all the, uh, the bad things that come along with it or the consequences of it will pass you by. So we see that going on in society today. I think that's, that's the majority of the problem is people are, you know, they, they realize they've been complacent and they've been indifferent and they really sincerely hope that the whole thing's just gonna pass them by. This too shall pass. And you know, if I just sit quietly back and watch and wait well, somebody will save me, right? <laughs> or somebody yeah. will, uh, will, will switch this and, and make things better. And that's not the case. We need to step up and uh, understand, you know, take our sovereignty back. And with that, our responsibility, uh, because it comes down to individual choice, things we can do. And uh, it's, it comes down to what are you going to do in well, your own life do. to make a difference, right? Well, or Don't do, don't do it. Sometimes right? it's very simple. Just say no, you don't have to right I, you don't have to yeah just say it. no I, I respect myself too much to put a mask on to social distance to put something in my body that i don't feel comfortable with putting in my body you know right uh, to compromise my own values whatever those values may be because they differ to everybody um one other thing i just want to add about the individual aspect we're all connected and that's another i feel like there's this cognitive dissonance like oh well that's just Shanghai, like that's happening in Shanghai, but that's not happening here, you know. Uh, I'm no, that'll in never happen here. Yeah, right? which I am in Florida, but you know, it's like, well, I I'm in Florida, so I don't have to, like, no, you do have to worry about that. And that's something that we've disconnected from, uh, you know, almost 100% of the things we consume that we don't even need anyway, but that's another story, come yeah. from a place where they treat people like, you know, I'm not saying we're so much better, but you know, it's open that they just treat people so horrifically and we just completely whoop, oh, that's okay, it's cheap. Hey, that's cheaper than going to the local guy, you know? And, and that's just an example, but I'm just saying, I'm not trying to push that particular agenda. I'm saying, understand if it happens to another living being, animals too, because um, right. we're becoming like that. <laughs> It's, it can happen to you. The more we tolerate, the less our resistance is to immoral things that are happening on a grand scale for profit or power or whatever, it's going to come around to you eventually too. So we are connected. We can no longer have the luxury of saying, well, that's just them. But right. you know, we have a constitution. So 
you know, we can't do that anymore. We do have an individual responsibility to ourselves and to protect our sovereignty, but we also have a responsibility to say, hey, that's not happening to me, but that shouldn't be happening to anybody. What's going on there, you know? And we, right. we don't do that either, you know, or just like, well, it's not me. So it's all good, I guess. And then that's kind of like what goes along with what, exactly what you're saying about burying your head in the sand and just, well, you know, whatever. That's, that's his kid. That's not my kid or, you know, whatever the case, because it, we're so connected. It's, it's, it's insane to think that where injustices in one area of the world are happening, that it won't ripple out. The acceptance of it in general is what feeds it and makes it more powerful and gives Precisely. it the ability the, to ripple out to the rest of us. Right. The more that people accept it as a normal thing or, you know, something that happens. For them, for right. others. It's not right. for us, but it's okay for them. Like, no. Right. It's Eventually okay it's coming anybody. here. Exactly. That's the problem. And people and don't seem to realize that. By the time they realize that, it's too late. It's like, wait right? a minute. Whoa, whoa, it's happening to us? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, I really hope we realize that because I, I only bring that into play because I feel like that is so much encompasses the spiritual aspect that we have been sorely deprived of understanding our interconnectedness, how we're just different points of attention, but we're all connected, you know, on the same way. And that goes for animals, for nature, you know, for humans, it's, it's all there. So it's, it's so important. Absolutely. Sorry. Yeah. I'll get off That's... my pulpit now, but <laughs> I just want to give some optimism because we've talked about a lot of things and I know it can be very scary, but I also know that, you know, this could all bring about a great opportunity for a lot of really wonderful changes, you know, tearing down these paradigms, these structures of power and, you know, allowing us to really live our potential of who we, you know, our God-given potential of who we really should be or right. meant to be. I agree. And the more self-sufficient you are, the better position you'll be in if things do actually go south. So if you learn how to grow some vegetables in a garden, uh, can some food, keep some storable foods, uh, keep storable supplies, uh, maybe uh, hook up a solar generator uh, to your house, uh, these kind of things, uh, you know, just basic survival skills, things like that, learn how to hunt, how to fish, uh, understand how to chop firewood and stuff like that know how to do this stuff just basic things that we take for granted today that uh, our ancestors had to do on the daily just to survive uh, if you understand how to survive and have some preparations in place to survive if things do go south you'll be in a much better place and also um, the things that are are planned uh, by these elites in the power circles here today it, you know they can potentially bring about some good things for us if we take the right course of action with it on an individual level. Uh, we could make something better for ourselves. Uh, you know, and, and what it comes down to is, is <clears throat> excuse me, you could reject their system that they're giving you, right? That they want to give you and push on you. You could say no, right? You could walk away. I mean, that's your sovereign right as a human being. As, as a human being, you could, you could say, no, I don't want to consent to that. And if you remove your consent from their system, their system will fall. No, it it can't pyramid. stand the whole house of cards call, comes crumbling down. If enough Bottom of us step back and that. say, nope, we're not doing that. And it's so and simple. It is simple. You, have you just numbers. have to say no. You just have to say no, have the courage to stand up and say no, and maybe be a little bit unpopular with who you think the quote unquote influencers are in society. Uh, because I, I could tell you right now, this, the things you see on television, the, the worldview they're trying to present to you on television and on the internet, it's not true. Go out in your own community and talk to people. Look around. You'll find it's totally different than what's being presented to you, what popular consensus is on everything. Uh, so that being the case, have the courage to stand up and say, no, not, not for me. I'm not doing that. And uh, stand on your convictions and stand tall on your convictions. And, you know, that, like I said, their whole house of cards will crumble if you reject that system that they're trying to give you and, and remove your consent from it, then it'll crumble and they won't be able to do anything about it. Right. And, and this all starts with grassroots and small communities and stuff like that. So they've tried um, to destroy and undermine. They have tried to destroy. Off. Most people don't even know who their neighbors are anymore. Yeah. If you know who your neighbors are and your neighbor has a certain skill set that you don't and, you know, make some compromises with them or something if it comes down to it. 
uh, like I'll trade you my strawberries for your bananas or, or whatever, you know what I mean? And, and work together. I mean, this is how society has uh, survived for millennia, right? We don't need all of this fancy technology in order to survive and all these financial systems Why? and all of this, all of these systems that have been put in place, right? We don't need all of this infrastructure. We could survive just fine within our communities. Communities have been doing it for, from time immemorial, right? Small communities, that, that's what it's about. Thrive. That's where we it has to start thrive. to get things back. Yeah, we don't need all the synthetic illusion of everything's better. We've never been sicker. We've never been right. more depressed. We've never been more, I think, just oppressed. We don't know who we are anymore. We don't know what we want. Even if we were free, free, we'd be like, well, I don't know what I want to do because I've just been told all my life I'm this cog in a wheel. And, you know, right. so, so is this stuff really better? No, it's just marketing, like you said, and everything's being pushed to tell us it's better. So we're like, well, okay, I guess it's better then. I got a lot more stuff than I, you know, yeah, I, mean, I got that, a lot of debt and I got a lot of bills and I guess, yeah, I guess it's better. But it's Yeah, but I got not. this big, big house and this new car and all of this stuff that doesn't matter at the end of the day if society collapses, right? As long as you have a roof yeah. over your head and enough food and some love, you got more than the average person then, right? You know, if you, you could survive and take care of yourself without somebody having to give you a handout. See, that that's the thing. I mean, uh, you know, if you set yourself in a position where you could be self-sufficient, the more self-sufficient you are, the less they are able to control you. Mm -hmm. And that is why they try to hook us into these systems. They hook us on the technologies. They hook us on, okay, well, here's the bank account. And if you want groceries, you go to the grocery store. You don't, you dare not grow your own food, you know, and that kind of thing and learn how to do all this stuff uh, and farm your own land and stuff like that. They want you to not have the first clue about how that whole supply chain works, right? Or not even they, know what food is. Wayne, right. I mean, we don't even know what food is anymore. 99% no. of what's in the store is not food. It's food-like substances. Right. It's synthetic, I right? Mean, it's, it's a lot it's, of ingredients and chemicals. And that's about it. It's, uh, it's, it's sad. And that's why we're insane. sick like we are. And, but we're like, oh, but it's us. We're inherently dirty and bad. And, you know, and, and this is our birthright. And, and, you know, I'll just tie it back in because you brought up Joseph Campbell, that story about the lion being raised around sheep. And then one, our tiger and, you know, the lion or tiger comes along and says, what are you doing with all these sheep? We eat sheep. We don't, you know, we don't sleep with them. And it, you know, it, look in the, look in the water, look at your reflection. You're actually, a, you're a lion, you're a tiger, you're whatever, you know, be who you were meant to be, not some meeker creature because you were told you were a sheep and you never actually saw yourself. All right, I'm getting right. crazy now, but you know what I mean. Like <laughs> no, I remember I that exactly was a story that he had, you know, told, and and we both actually, funny enough, we both have lions there. But you know, it's like we, we just don't understand even who we are. And the more we can do for ourselves, it's not even about defeating, you know, the overlords or the powerful people or globalists. It's just about like winning back ourselves or right. <laughs> who we are. You know, we just need to. I just like to dumb things down because when we make it like a battle, we then we become like the, the person we're fighting. You know, you see that happen so often. You take on somebody and you become just like them in order to try to defeat them. Right. I guess I, I, I get where you're coming too. from. Yeah. Because yeah, I see where you're coming from. When we defeated uh, Darth Vader, he pulled off the mask and it was him. Yeah. It's it's like. Uh, Precisely. I mean, that's the way it is. I mean, it, it is an individual spiritual battle for each of us. But uh, at the end of the day, like I said, the only mind you can change is your own. Uh, so change the way you behave, change the way you do things, and uh, better prepare yourself uh, for being more self-sufficient and uh, being less dependent upon the system, so to say. And if we could all do that, then the system will eventually crumble or they will have to uh, revamp their system to make it something that's desirable for people. Because if people aren't uh, indebted to the system or dependent upon the system, then they have no need of the system. And if they have no need of the system, 
they may not want to use the system if the system presents a lot of bad choices to them, which it does at this point, right? In order to go along to get along, you have to follow uh, certain ways of doing things in this society. And it's all corrupt. I mean, look, look at it, like government levels on down. It's corrupt. Uh, the way businesses operate anymore, it's corrupt. It's all about the bottom line, the dollar. There's no human factor anymore. It's, it's not like uh, the old days. If there was a, you know, uh, Mr. Jones owned the general store, you went down there, you were short a little bit of cash, didn't have enough. Okay, well, here, take this home. When you get it, pay me. You know, there's none of that anymore. You now it's like, sorry, get out of here, pal. You don't have enough to pay for it um, because it's a major corporation. It's all corporation. It's all that running the system. Corporation derived from the word corpse. It's a dead entity. See, it, do, do you understand why I say it's, it's a death cult, like the whole thing here? It's a dead entity. It's, it's the reign of dead matter, as Michael Hoffman calls it. And that's exactly what we're being programmed to accept and to step into. But we could step away and say, no, we don't want that for ourselves or our families. Uh, we'll learn to do some things for ourselves and be a little bit more self-sufficient. And no, thank you. We decline your offer. And that's what it comes down to. Everything's an offer, exactly. right? So uh, it, it's an offer. No, we decline your offer. That's that. And they can't force it on you as much as they want to claim they could force different uh, behaviors and stuff on you. At the end of the day, they can't. Well, it, it's the free will principle. It's a natural law in this place. If they violate that, they're going to have karmic retribution for it, and they know it. And uh, those that are stupid enough to not know that and try to force something anyway will learn the hard way, won't they? Uh, so, you know, anybody that's uh, an employer out there that says, if you want to remain employed here, you have to go get this COVID shot. They're going to learn the hard way. In there, yeah. They're going to learn the hard way, aren't they? Because they cannot force you to do something you do not want to do. That's, that's the real secret here. Uh, that, that comes down to sovereignty and free will. And we all have that choice and it's a natural law, it's a natural principle, and that's why they do everything they can to try to coerce or trick you into consenting to things that you don't want to, because then they could kind of skirt around that karmic principle. But if you outright refuse and are steadfast and stand behind your decision and your principles, they have no choice but to let you go and and do what you want to do. And sometimes it's a tough choice for people to make because they do their very best to make it uh, as difficult for you as possible or as painful as possible to decline something like that. Uh, but in the end, they will be the ones that will suffer the karmic consequences for that action. So uh, all you can do is step away and say, you know what? No, I'm, I'm not going to participate. Thank you for the offer, but no. And uh, there's really nothing more they could do to you about that. It's just a matter of, uh, you know, how are they going to be able to live with themselves pushing something like, uh, I, and here's the thing. I, I like to use this whole vaccine as the, the case study for this, because uh, we see all kinds of harmful ramifications from these vaccines happening right now already. And I think they're only going to get worse through the next couple of years. So if you were a, uh, a manager somewhere or something, and uh, we're forcing your employees to take this, and they become really sick and perhaps die or something. Are you going to be able to live with yourself if you find out that that's the reason that was the cause of that? And so, I mean, this karmic thing comes into play at some point uh, with all of that. So we need to make a, a decision on our own and decide, uh, you know, either yes or no, I'm not going to, to consent to that. Uh, so, you know, if, if you, uh, if you really try to coerce somebody in this way, like a lot of places have, it has bad karmic retribution for you. Let's put it that way, because it's disingenuous, right? It's not, there's no true, uh, true uh, consent being done per se, when you're uh, threatening somebody's livelihood. Like, you know, if you don't do this, you're not going to have a job. Well, that, that's enough for some people to say, okay, to reluctantly say, okay, I'll do it you know, because they have no choice there, or they feel they have no choice. But that's not true informed consent, is it? And that's where not we're in the distinction is that's, that's forcing your hand, it's forcing, uh, you know, your own power or your own will on somebody. And the, the term will is a very loaded occult word uh, in a lot of senses here, but that's exactly what's being done. Uh, 
But anyway, I, I think and we've for, spoke enough about yeah, uh, the vaccine. Yeah, I mean, and for side those who are trying to take it to escape some fate that they're being told will be, you know, reckon upon them, I still think like read a story like Oedipus. It's always that way. You try to avoid something and you're told this is the magic solution to doing it. It's in all the stories, it's in Game of Thrones, it's, in, you know. Every time you try to, you're told something's bad's gonna happen, so you better do this. And you like try, you just base your whole life around that avoidance of that one thing. It usually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So that's another side of it too. It's like for the people who are just so dead set on, I'm not getting this, I'm not dying of it. You know, it's like, you're not trusting in just the natural flow of existing. Right. You're just not, you're, you're resisting, you're fighting against it. And I think resistance is a very important thing, which is what this cult is essentially doing. They're resisting, like you said, the natural order of things. When you right. do that, you usually, it has an adverse effect. It never right. has the effect you intended for it to have. So this resistance, this abdicating our free will and our minds and any sense of personal responsibility is always seems to have the opposite effect of what it's intended to. Right. And, and that's, that's the bottom line here. Whenever somebody's trying to coerce you to do something, that should give you the feeling, first of all, why, why do I need to be coerced to do this? Like, it's so great. When you think on the, on the simple level like that, if, if this is such a good thing, why is it, why, why are they having such pushback with it? You know what I mean? Why, why is it such a problem? Why are they pushing it so hard? If it's something that's good, right? People should should want it and will line up to get it if it really works and it's really good, right? You have to have a sense of humor about it because they're like, oh, we have a lottery and oh, look, uh, like <laughs> some celebrity, we're going to put it on TV. Like even Biden said himself, why am I doing this on TV? <laughs> I think he got his booster. It's yep. just so funny. Like, you know, look, uh, whoever, you know, Jay-Z or I'm making this up, but you know, got it, got it. And we're going to televise it and, or, or we'll give you free fries or we'll, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, like, uh, are you okay? Like what the hell is wrong with you? It's just kind of, I, I got to have to. It's over the top. Let's put it that it. way. Yeah, yeah. It's over the top. It and really they is. think they're being subtle and it's just, it's kind of funny because if I don't, laugh i'll cry <laughs> yeah i mean it's sad that uh, a lot of people have bought into the narrative the way they have but uh, you know it is what it is and the best we could do is maybe speak out about it and let people know hey this isn't exactly what you think it is right and yep. and point out the yeah. inconsistencies and stuff like that and, and, and i like to go the to the tricks, and the tricks of the trade too uh -huh. of how they're accomplishing this and how they're hijacking your mind Right. And that's an important thing to understand. That's why I do the things I do. I want people to understand, first of all, what is it that these people that are pushing this believe and what methods are they using? Because if you could understand those two things, uh, then you're better equipped to fight back against it. And uh, that's that's the bottom line here, because nobody likes to be manipulated. Right. And that's what's been going on. And we've been manipulated to a massive degree through the decades here. And uh, we see uh, just the past two years how they've rolled this all out into uh, this massive social engineering campaign. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've been steered in two years in ways that it, it would take decades prior to this whole, the rollout of this whole thing to do. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've come to accept things as the new normal today that we shouldn't, right? And this all happened in a very short amount of time. If you go back to 2019 and tell people, hey, you know what, next year you're gonna lock yourself in your house for three months or something and wear a mask everywhere you go, they would think you're crazy. Yeah. Think about that. You can't do that. Nobody would, yeah. nobody would do that. You know? Yeah. Every, the world's going to shut down for two Oh, weeks. and you're going to police yourselves too. Yeah. You're actually yeah. going to police your neighbors and they won't even have to enforce it. You'll enforce it upon each other. Yeah. And then, you know, the further question would be, well, why would I do that? Because somebody had a cold. <laughs> think about yeah. the absurdity of that. Uh, when it comes down to it, uh, or because somebody got the flu, well, <laughs> you know, it's fighting the natural order again. Yeah. We need sickness. Sickness gets out all the. That's why when stuff comes out of your nose and it's gross, it's gross. But you need that because your body is protecting you against outside things that don't need to be inside of you. 
it's the, it's just the way it's the cycle of life. There's a little bit of pain to get to the pleasure, you know, everything has to kind of cycle out right. and we're kind of like not accepting that anymore. It's like, no common cold can't have that. Then there, you're, you're defective. There's something wrong with you. We have to quarantine you. We have to put you in a camp, you know, and that's just not, it's right. not how and we're built. And once again, there's there's this subtle uh, archetype being played there too. Um, it's this artificial type of uh, uh, wiping out of illness, so to say. That's the promise of the transhumanist future. Mm -hmm. See, we'll be able to, you know, eliminate all disease and even aging and death by doing this transhumanist singularity. That's what they're subtly queuing up, right? It's an artificial response to a natural thing. It's an artificial substitute, right? It's a synthetic version of something that is a spiritual promise for us, right? Because we're told, I mean, if, if you follow any type of theology or if you, you, know, you follow the Christian religion, we know uh, one day there'll be no more disease, no more death, uh, no more tears, no more illness, nothing of that sort. It's a spiritual promise and it's, it's a promise of God. And that's the natural version of this. And that's the, the uh, you know, the real thing right yeah. this is an artificial substitute for that this is what you would call the spirit of antichrist at work right it's an an alternative christ see that's what they're offering here it's a, the system is an alternative to that and that that's exactly what they're looking for they're trying to create that in the physical world here and it's not going to work for them the way they promise but it's how they get people on the hook and that's how they're trying to uh, manipulate and steer people towards this idea because I'm telling you at some point this whole transhumanist ideology is going to be introduced as the cure all of all of mankind's problems isn't it? it it'll it'll heal all health problems you won't have any sickness or illness anymore we'll defeat death uh, we'll be able to defeat aging you'll be able to uh, you know uh, transfer your consciousness into any type of a vessel that you want at any time it'll be an ultimate freedom you'll have uh, all this cognitive intelligence you'll you'll be able to uh, access all the information of the world at will in your mind and and all of people's collective experiences you, you see how it all cycles together it's it's a promise that is a cheap knockoff of what's in store for us in the spiritual that God has planned for us. Of it's it's a cheap knockoff of the creation of the natural creation. That's what they're trying to simulate, and that's what it is. It's a simulation, right? Because uh, I don't for I don't, I, and this is one of my firm beliefs. I don't believe if they're able to actually say quote unquote transfer somebody's consciousness into a machine. I don't think that's an actual soul or spirit in there. It's it's just a uh, a replica. Of it's a course. it's a, a convincing machine. So that, that's about it. And every time you try to manipulate or change something, that's when the sickness arises. All this technology <laughs> has caused so much sickness. All these jabs of all kinds have caused all the sickness. So the antidote always seems to be actually the root cause when you're trying to manipulate what's already naturally existing on its own it's the root cause of all the pain and suffering and every, you know, how do we get peace? We go to war. Yeah. That doesn't you make know, sense. Like we it? just, we always want that magic pill, but it's already there. Peace is just be peaceful. That's peace. You don't need war to get to peace. So, you know, it's just that we st stop trying to put something on something else to prevent something, it probably would be just fine the way it is. But when you try to always manipulate and cajole, that's actually what creates, creates the all problem. the problems. So it's just, it's, it's bananas, but I, I do want to preserve your time. You've given so much and, and I thank you so much for your generosity. I did also notice that Amazon says this came out February 21st, Wayne, what's up with that? Well, it's actually the, the hardcover version. The 22nd. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. The, the hardcover version came out the oh, okay. 22nd. All right. So, I didn't see that. I was looking because I, I did see your interview about the, the numerology aspect of it. So. See, here's the thing with Amazon. Sometimes if you submit your manuscript and stuff like that and have all your, and your T's and, and, you know, your T's crossed and your I's dotted and stuff and you submit it, sometimes it takes them a couple days to approve it. So I, I made sure I like set it up and, and stuff a day early in case it took them a little bit of time to approve, but they approved it 
like within just a couple hours, which is not the normal there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I had the, I also had, like I said, I, I had planned uh, the hardcover. So I did the hardcover the next day and got that one uh, ah. for the 22nd as well, because awesome. once again, it, it comes down to uh, that. They always like to play the games with the numbers. Uh, so uh, I figured this is something they use an archetype they use against the masses. I'll flip the script and I'll, yeah. I'll use that on them this Literally. time. And uh, yeah, so even though uh, it looks like that, you know, that tried to be prevented, it's still <laughs> at one version of the book came out on the 22nd. So that, awesome. that's the hardcover one was okay. uh, published the 22nd. Awesome. I didn't see that for some reason, but that's awesome. Okay, so just two more things and I'm going to let you go, but I really hope you'll come back on. Oh, certainly. Anytime. Because I, I hope you're not like, oh God, I can never get off with this person. I know, you know, it runs long, but I just feel like if it goes there, it goes there. But I, I would love to talk about your other two books, which I've read. I'm not at the same time, but you know, if you right. down the line, if you come back on, I, I think these, this stuff is so important too. Um, oh, it is. Definitely, guys, if you get this book, The Demic of Pan, it's, it's a great book and it's chock full of really useful information to arm your mind with. Can you just tell us what you have coming up and you've kind of alluded to that, two more books and how people can find you? All right. Well, uh, basically, if you put my name in the, the search browser, my books should come up. Uh, they're available on Amazon or pretty much anywhere else you buy books right now. Um, I'm available on, uh, you could book on rockfin, R-O-K-F-I-N dot com backslash Wayne McCroy. And uh, my channel there is called Alchemical Tech Revolution. I also produce the, the podcast, Alchemical Tech Revolution, that's available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, my good friend Jason Lingren and I do a live stream on his Secrets of Saturn Rockfin channel as well. People can check me out there. And I'm also a frequent guest and contributor on Crow 777 Radio. That's C-R-R-O-W-777 radio.com. Uh, and, uh, you know, those are pretty much all the places I could be found at this point. Um, and you can just type in the search engine, the name of the book, it should come up to all them are available through Amazon. Uh, I have four of them available right now. I am working on a fifth book and uh, have the, uh, um, the research and uh, the notes put together for a sixth book uh, that I plan on trying to get out here pretty quickly too. So I'm hoping to have the fifth book out by the end of the year. We'll see how that all comes together. It's, it's one of those things. It's hard to Hard to a lot of times uh, compile these things, but that one is uh, going to be an interesting one as well. Uh, well, both of them will be interesting. Uh, so I have a working title and I haven't completely authenticated yet with it, but uh, I could give you that if you, you'd like to hear it. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> this one is called Autism AI and the Singularity. Uh, mm. That's the title of that book. So, uh, and the, the subtitle is Digitizing Human Consciousness. Uh, so that's the one I'm working on currently. I should have that out. That's kind of a, a, uh, a carryover from my, my uh, second book, The Autism Epidemic, Transhumanism's Dirty Little Secret. Uh, that's a continuation of that work. So uh, it, it should be an interesting one. I, I get into a bit more details as to uh, about how this whole transhumanist thing does apply most definitely to autism and various of these other disorders that are going on with people. Uh, and I, I can show um, documentation of how this is, you know, has been planned and has been thought about and talked about and how it relates because a lot of people seem to think that, uh, you know, maybe it's a step too far or a bridge too far for some people to, to speak in that, those terms. But uh, I assure you, yeah, there's definitely something to it. <laughs> I've looked very deeply into it because it's a subject that affects me on a very personal level. So, uh, you know, it's something I've, I've explored very deeply and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to getting that one out too. Yeah. And I just read this very recently and coincidentally, I, you had said they changed it from autist autism awareness month to autism acceptance. And, uh, I was on LinkedIn recently and all of a sudden I'm seeing all the, cause now it's become Facebook, LinkedIn, some way, somehow, um, all these, different initiatives and people showing their corporate push for, and, and it said autism acceptance. Right. And I never thought about that. I was like, oh my God. And also I, I'm originally from New Jersey where I believe now it's one in four or something. It's, it's, it's very like high. Astronomical 
of, of anywhere, I think, right? I think New Jersey has the most autism. Um, yeah, and something else I wanted to get, would definitely I want to touch on later on, not today, obviously, because you, you, you have to, you have family and you have a life to get back to, but you know, just why they're targeting ma males. It just seems to be throughout every kind of, uh, just all this occult, everything. It is, yeah. It's, I'm so curious to understand why that is and, and with autism in particular as well. Um, but yeah, and I know you have a few, one or three, sorry, children. Uh, I, I have autism. six kids total. I have yeah, three, I mean, three with, with autism. Three with autism. That's what I yeah. thought I'd read. Um, yeah. So, and I have a couple of friends with children with autism. So um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting, and I definitely want to explore that with you. So if you come on again, I, I would be eternally grateful for that. And I, yeah, sure. We, we should grateful. set that up sometime soon. Yeah. And thank you so much, Wayne. I mean, you just, we could talk for hours because your books are, you know, they're very easy reads, I want to say, but they're, you can unpack them for days, which I love that kind of thing. You know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a very rare, um, quality to come upon when you, when you talk about, you know, authors and information of this sort. So thank you so much for sharing all that for, you know, being that light, shining your light out into the world and sharing this information and, you know, not hoarding it like some people do, the important oh. information and secrets that we need to know. Uh, and, you know, thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been so great. So oh. th thank you. Well, thank you for having me on. I always enjoy going on uh, new platforms and stuff and reaching new minds out there because that's what it's about. Uh, thank you so much for doing the things you do too. Yes. Well, it's all, it's all you guys. I, I owe it to all my guests. So you guys really are the show. So thank you again. I can't say it enough. Have a great night. I will be in touch to bother you again, to have you on to talk about <laughs> other things because we, we've only just begun and uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. I'll put all your information in the, the notes and I'll send you links. So, okay. Sounds okay. good. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wayne. Have a great night. You too. Bye. Bye.